thank you uh, and welcome back. Um, um, so, we are now, where are we? Okay, yes. I see item 10. Uh, we'll start uh, the high level segment. Uh, the intersection between climate change, food security, migration, and displacement. Um, so that's the focus of the conversation. So I have the um, distinct pleasure to invite the Director General to um, open the discussion. Director General, you have the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and good afternoon to all of you, Excellencies. Climate change and environmental degradation and disasters have become even deeper concerns for countries across the world in 2022, exacerbated by increasing food insecurity. This is particularly the case of small islands developing states, least developed countries, and those living in the most vulnerable regions across the planet. We have known for more than 30 years since the first Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC report of 1990, that climate change is a risk multiplier capable of rapidly reshaping patterns of human mobility. The latest IPCC uh, 6 assessment report that was published earlier this year has unequivocally concluded that it is today more than ever before having profound impacts on why, where, and how people move, in particular in Africa and Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Our deteriorating environment alone should be cause for immediate action. Since my first statement to this Council in 2018, I have emphasized the deep impacts that climate change will have and is already having on patterns of movement, a priority flagged in the strategic vision 2019-2023. IOM's institutional strategy on migration, environment and climate change 2021-2030 encapsulated our approach to this crucial issue. But what has become very evident this year is the dominance of acute multidimensional crises. Crises born from a reality where ongoing climate impacts have combined with the lingering effects of pandemic, political and economic instability, rising food and fertilizer prices, and the global reverberations of conflict in Europe. These factors have created unprecedented levels of food insecurity in much of the world. November 22 estimates from the World Food Programme across the 79 countries in which they have an operational presence show that the number of acutely food insecurity people will reach 349 million in 2022. 349 million. 200 million more than before the pandemic. In such a context, it will be naive to think people will not move. And indeed, in the Progress Declaration of the First International Migration Review Forum, adopted by consensus this May in New York, member states expressed exactly the same concern. This is why, in the wake of the 27th UN Climate Conference of the Parties, the COP27, we have decided to host this high-level discussion as part of our annual council meeting. This is, I believe, particularly important given the key decisions taken in Sharm el-Sheikh under the presidency of Egypt. And I want to salute and congratulate the Egyptian presidency for a very successful handling of the work of the COP27. Decisions uh, which have achieved a breakthrough in terms of recognizing climate change impacts on communities, as well as the human mobility induced by climate change. IOM was deeply engaged in the COP27 preparations and process. We have worked with our, your authorities, the member states authorities and the delegations to elicit these key changes. In my view, COP27 will be remembered as a major step forward in favor of developing countries 
least developed countries and those in most vulnerable situations, including displaced persons and migrants. By acknowledging the rights of migrants, but also, and I quote, the growing gravi gravity, scope, and frequency in all regions of loss and damage associated with the adverse effects of climate change, resulting in devastating economic and non-economic losses, including forced displacement and impacts on cultural heritage, human mobility, and the lives and livelihoods of local communities, I quoted, issues that were outlined in the COP27 cover decision, the Sharm El Sheikh implementation plan, as you know, we are now in a position to better prevent, address this situation. Equally relevant is the initiative taken by the Secretary General of launching an early warning system for climate change and environmental degradation that will be run by the World Meteorological Organization. The early warning systems are particularly relevant to focus our attention on prevention and building the resilience of the communities to prepare for the impacts of climate change in their livelihoods. Through the establishment of new funding arrangements for responding to loss and damage associated with the adverse effects of climate change, including a focus on addressing gaps such as climate-related emergencies, sea level rise, displacement, relocation, migration, and other non-economic losses, the parties at Sharm El Sheikh have also paved the way to more adequate sustainable and accessible funding for affected communities. It's relevant to emphasize that a large part of member states, both from the Global South as well as the Global North, have emphasized the need to have to access to funding for adaptation, for prevention, for building resilience, and they have all emphasized the need to facilitate the access of the existing green funding uh, funds. A key role will have to be played by strategic stakeholders, such as the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, and all the multilateral development banks, as we are already doing in a partnership with the African Development Bank. At the technical level, mechanisms such as the Santiago Network for Loss and Damage and its further operationalization will allow us to strengthen our cooperation for the benefit of developing countries needing expertise and support, and in this area, the transfer of technology is extremely relevant. At the International Dialogue on Migration in October this year, on this precise same topic, delegates recognize the importance of partnerships with the private sector, with diaspora groups, and identified policy and administrative gaps that could be addressed to develop safer and more accessible migration pathways. Participants exchange examples of instruments that could serve as good practices to address mounting humanitarian needs and above all, offer durable solutions, including, of course, free movement agreements to persons on the move. An increasing number of disaster situations are unfolding each year. Multi-year droughts and catastrophic hurricanes and floods have contributed to a severe anger crisis that will worsen in 2023. Thus, we will have to work further together and, above all, work together urgently to ensure that migration induced by climate change is also understood as an adaptation strategy that can mitigate these scenarios. Having publicly raised my own concerns about the impacts of climate change on most vulnerable countries and people over all these years, I would like to express my deep gratitude to each of you whose countries have worked end in end with us, whether through implementation of the Global Compact for Migration or at COP27 earlier this month, to ensure that the rights and the well-being of the persons we serve remain at the center of our concerns. I look forward today to hearing from you this afternoon and tomorrow morning as to the steps that now we can take to ensure that the vital recognition 
and the progress of COP27 is not lost, and that those who desperately need our help, those who desperately need food for themselves and their children can receive that support. Thank you. Thank you, uh, dear Sir General, thank you. Um, next, uh, we have a video message from Mr. Ku Dongu, the Director General of Food and Agriculture Organization. Um, you have the floor, read the message. Excellencies, dear colleagues, thank you for the opportunity to address you during this segment of the ILM Council. Food security, migration, climate change, and displacement are closely interconnected and widely recognized, including by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, and recently by the COP27. The latest IPCC report recognizing that the impact of the climate crisis have contributed to migration and displacement, damaged the livelihood, and increased the food insecurity globally. Climate change negatively impacts food security through the extreme weather event and slow onset disasters. Is the climate exposed to the sector such as agriculture, forestry, fishery being the most effective? Rural people, including the pastoralists and the fish community, are the most vulnerable as they rely heavily on their natural resources for their food and livelihood. At the same time, we have few opportunities and resources to adapt to the changing climate. Climate risks are contributing to the displacement in all regions of the world, and it is likely to increase due to the intensification of extreme events, such as heavy rains, flooding, cyclones, and droughts. In addition, related to the loss of the traditional livelihood and the competition of, for scarce natural resources can increase the risk of the conflict. Climate change poses an additional burden on the populations in situations of uh, protracted displacement who are already extremely vulnerable. Within 80% of the world displaced being in countries or territories affected by the acute food insecurity and the malnutrition. When rural livelihoods are compromised by the impact of the uh, climate crisis, people might experience a high pressure to immigrate or may be forcibly displaced. Many vulnerable populations may also become trapped in the high-risk areas, lacking the ability to move. Effort is working to address the, the adverse uh, drivers of migration and the impact of the climate crisis on rural livelihoods, and to strengthen the anticipatory action to avert the risk of the displacement. If it works with the rural communities to better manage climate-related risk by promoting the uptake of the climate adaptive practices, the sustainable use and the management of natural resources, and the restoration of degraded ecosystems. Actions needed to be part of a community-led solutions for climate resilient development, disaster response, and the climate mobility. And should also recognize the migration as a potential positive force for the green transition and for the development of the green agri-food systems. In support of the transformation of global agri-food systems to be more efficient, more inclusive, more resilient, and more sustainable. Investment and the transfer of skills and knowledge in climate resilient livelihood and the climate smart technologies can contribute to promoting green agribusiness and improve the access to the food. New pathways for resilience should also seek to create enabling conditions to harness the potential of a migration for climate change and adaptation in the areas of origin, transit and destination. Thanks to its unique technical expertise, FAO plays a key role in providing a bridge between migration and culture and the climate stakeholders. Acting as a neutral platform and leveraging its wider presence in rural areas to achieve the concrete impact on the ground. FAO stand ready to work with all the partners to ensure the better production, better nutrition, 
a better environment, a better life for leaving no one behind. And thank you. Thank you, Director General. Um, I have another video message from Ms. Valeri Guarnieri, Deputy Executive Director for WFP, World Food Program. Um, you have the floor. Distinguished delegates, thank you to our colleagues at IOM for holding this high-level segment and inviting WFP to be part of the dialogue. In 2022, food insecurity has reached unprecedented levels in many parts of the world. We've seen a backslide in development progress by almost 20 years, with 828 million people now suffering from chronic hunger. Just in the countries where WFP works, 349 million people are suffering from acute hunger in the wake of conflict, climate, and economic shocks. There are some common factors in how climate change, food insecurity, and migration and displacement intersect. For one, food insecurity contributes as a driver to displacement and aggravates the conditions in which displaced people find themselves. And displacement can lead to food crises as agricultural lands are left behind or high numbers of displaced people create unmanageable demand in host areas. In Somalia, for instance, where I traveled earlier this month, we've seen how four seasons of failed rains have displaced more than one million people this year alone and created conditions that may lead to famine. The event is still unfolding, and I do hope that we'll see increased donor support to sustain the massive humanitarian response that is now underway but it already represents a record surge in the number of people who are displaced by climate extremes in sub-Saharan Africa and require urgent food assistance to survive. In Pakistan, around 10 million people were displaced by record monsoon floods, which followed a record heat wave. This has also knocked out local food production and infrastructure for the short to medium term, causing more than $30 billion in damage. The World Bank projects that by 2050, as many as 216 million people could be compelled to migrate within their own countries, which would be almost eight times as many as today. This is why WFP is working with populations in countries like Guatemala by introducing new farming techniques and building water reservoirs or helping people adapt to climate change and mitigate the risks of climate-induced migration. WFP actively participates in the Global Compact on Migration and commends its objective to promote safe, regular, and effective pathways for migrants worldwide. As we approach the end of 2022, displacement is reaching new records in many parts of the world and food insecurity continues to worsen. Humanitarian action and social protection are essential to shield people from harm and help them cope during times of crisis. At the same time, humanitarian aid can't be our only go-to solution. As we contend with rising fragility and losses and damages from climate change, we share the views of the IOM Council that a strong focus needs to be put on quality programs which empower and protect the most vulnerable and scale up solutions that work for them. We value the long-standing strong and collaborative partnership between IOM and WFP, one of our strongest operational partners in the UN system. If we all can rise to this challenge and work across institutional boundaries to support people and strengthen systems they depend on, we will avoid even greater humanitarian crises down the line. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, WFE. Thank you. Uh, we now move to member states. Um, the first on my list is the Honorable J. Udok Sengibao, Senior the Vice President of Palau, also via video. The EIC House. Excellent. Honorable Chairperson, Director General, distinguished guest, I wish to convey the warm greetings from the leadership and people 
of the Republic of Palau to the Council on the occasion of its 113th session. I wish at the outset to congratulate the chairperson of this 113th session of the Council. I also extend our appreciation to Her Excellency Catalina de Vandas Aguilar for her leadership in the last session of the Council. On behalf of our government and people, I extend our sincere appreciation to this body for all the assistance received since Palau officially became a member state of IOM in 2018. In counter trafficking and migrant assistance, IOM plays a facilitating role in advancing the government's counter trafficking efforts and promotes dialogue on issues revolving around human trafficking. It also provides assistance to victims of trafficking and other vulnerable migrants, accommodates their respective different needs as individuals, including safe accommodation, medical and psychological support, and assisted voluntary return and reintegration. In disaster risk reduction, IOM has capitalized on its extensive technical expertise in climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction and worked with the community to enhance public infrastructures and make them more resilient to natural disaster, developed a rainwater collection and storage system in schools and communities that lack stable water sources. In COVID-19 readiness and response, IOM works closely with Palau government and other relevant agencies to ensure service access to migrants in times of crisis and that COVID related resources are available to migrant populations in languages that they understand. It is only relevant that I may mention the COVID-19 pandemic because it is an added contributing factor for some of the pressing issues that we discuss as a global community. This stresses the limited finances and available assistance for small island developing states, including Palau, in their efforts to fight against the impacts of climate change, food insecurities, migration and displacement, making it even more difficult to identify where exactly is the intersection and if we are anywhere closer to identifying means for effective responses. I cannot reiterate further what continues to be said and publicized about the unrealistic reality of Palau's high income categorization. Such is not reflective of our vulnerability as a small island nation, which has resulted in Palau's inability to receive assistance that we desperately need for sustainable measures, including measures to effectively respond to impact impacts of these very global issues that we talk about today. It is not fighting the pandemic first and climate change next. It is not deciding between adaptation measures for migrants into our respective nations or our own people migrating to other nations. It is all of the above. It is establishing networks operating at all levels of governance, the public and private sectors, to achieve transformative systems of solutions that can address clusters of actions across all areas development. Solutions that can overcome multiple trade-offs in time and space between ecological integrity and socioeconomic goals now. Palau prioritizes a food secure community. 
its efforts in providing the local communities with assistance in establishing effective, supportive, and inclusive farm-based initiatives contribute to the following SDGs. SDG 2, end hunger, achieve food security, and improve nutrition and su promote sustainable agriculture. SDG 8, promote sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment, and decent work for all. And SDG 2L, ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns. Palau is also progressing with the use of renewable energy sources, government and businesses infrastructures, and individual homeowners continue to invest in renewable energy sources, which contribute to sustainability through the reduction of greenhouse gases. Among others, this progress contributes to the following SDGs. SDG 7, ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. And SDG 9, build resilient infrastructure, promote inclusive and sustainable industrialization and foster innovation. The protection of Pala's natural environment continues, which is a great help in both the adaptation and mitigation efforts of Palau against climate change. This continued work of Palau, among others, contributes to the following SDGs. SDG 6, ensure availability and sustainability management of water and sanitation for all. And SDG 15, protect, restore, and promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, sustainably manage forest, combat desertification, and halt and reverse land degradation and halt biodiversity loss. Palau and the rest of the Pacific small island developing states, SIDS, face a unique set of security and development challenges. We don't stand to compare with developed countries in resources necessary to the successful delivery of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The need for a stronger global partnership of nations, organizations, and people cannot be stressed any further. Our shared challenges cannot be faced with and dealt with at the national or regional level alone. In noting how these challenges are becoming more dangerous, as members of this uh, body of the IOM, we must recognize these challenges and acknowledge the need for a stronger partnership to help our individual nations and regions fight these global issues. The call for transformative actions is long overdue. At this 113th session of the Council, we must take an integrative approach and treat our systems, our processes as a whole in support of grasping and tackling with the complexity of all our collective problems. We must implement major and effective strategies, including making necessary cultural changes and if adopting different significant technologies that will bring forth meaningful ways to meet new supply and demand. Honorable Chairperson, Palau strongly supports IOM. We look forward to your leadership and that of the IOM Council Bureau to help facilitate work in the coming year on how we can better support the organization to achieve effective responses to the issues of climate change food security, migration, and displacement. Ms. Ulang, thank you for your attention and have a fruitful and productive meeting of the 113th Council.
Thank you, Excellency. Thank you. Um, next on my list, um, the distinguished uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Egypt, uh, His Excellency Mr. Saleh Sukri, who was also president of COP27. Um, Excellency, you have the floor. I suppose it's also the air. Antonio Vettorino, Director General of the International Organization for Migration, Excellencies, Distinguished Participants. It gives me great pleasure to participate in this year's session of the Council of the IOM, which focuses on a vital and timely issue, namely the intersection between climate change, food security, migration, and displacement. Migration, food insecurity, and water scarcity induced by climate change are growing issues of concern which require coherent and long-term solutions. Egypt acting as president of COP27 and as champion for the implementation of the Global Compact for Migration places climate justice as a top priority, including through tackling the adverse effects of climate change which create the circumstances for compelling people to leave their countries. Discussions during COP27 held in Sharm el-Sheikh have shown that we cannot deal with climate change, migration, and displacement in silos. Thus, we sought to strengthen integrated and inclusive adaptation action, planning to avert the adverse effects of climate change and environmental degradation to build resilience and enhance regular pathways for safe, orderly, and regular migration through fair recruitment that respects human dignity. Following two weeks of tough negotiations, we managed to adopt the long-awaited loss and damage fund for assisting developing countries that are particularly vulnerable to the adverse effects of climate change. We were keen to focus discussions on implementation and addressing funding gaps for climate action, believing that it is unfair for developing countries to borrow and be burdened with more debt in order to adapt to a crisis they contributed the least to. Therefore, new funding and pledges and projects for developing countries were announced in the areas of adaptation and mitigation. Excellencies, distinguished participants, under the Egyptian presidency of COP27, the COP of implementation, action-oriented initiatives were launched aiming at protecting livelihoods and preventing displacement, particularly for countries and people in vulnerable situations threatened by food-related risks and insecurities. Among these initiatives is the Food and Agriculture for Sustainable Transformation Initiative, which aims at addressing food insecurity in countries most vulnerable to adverse impacts of climate change, including through improving financial contribution to develop sustainable farming and food systems and meet the urgent needs of food importing developing countries. In addition, AWARE initiative was launched to address water security as part of climate change adaptation aiming at raising awareness on the nexus between water and climate resilience and placing water at the heart of climate action. To conclude, what we have achieved is just a step in our journey towards a world more aware of the challenges facing its people, a world more determined to deal with the adverse effects of climate change and willing to address displacement and its root causes that could undermine peace, stability, and prosperity in countries of origin and destination. Only international solidarity and cooperation will enable us to overcome these challenges, delivering for the peoples and our planet. I thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you, and congratulations on a very successful um, conference, COP27. You made Africa proud and the world proud. Thank you. Um, next on my list, uh, we are honored with the presence of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Regional Cooperation, and Burkina abroad, or Burkina Faso, His Excellency, or Her Excellency Olivia Rag, Rag, Ramba. Excellency, you have the floor. I, my apologies <laughs> for, for, for <laughs> rambling through here. Monsieur le President du Conseil. Chair of the Council, this Director General distinguished participants. Chair, 
of the council. You're right. My name is not easy to pronounce. Otherwise, we have Wendy, which which means uh, being patient with God. Allow me to congratulate the chair of the council of the International Organization for Migration for his wise leadership and the initiative that the organization has taken with this meeting of the council on such a significant subject. President, the effects of climate change dangerously threaten the balance of our planet and could undermine our efforts in achieving the sustainable development goals. That is why my country is welcomes the progress of the 27th Conference of the Parties, which has just finished in Sharm el-Sheikh in Egypt, and during which delegates recognized, as they have never done before, the intrinsic links between the effects of climate change and human mobility. Indeed, Burkina Faso, and to a large extent, the whole Sahel region is confronted by growing challenges when it comes to security and development in terms of the complex interaction of various growing risks, in particular climate change, environmental degradation, food insecurity, terrorism, and internal displacements of populations. To date, Burkina Faso has just under 2 million internally displaced people forced to leave their homes due to attacks by extremist groups uh, who rage throughout the region, but also due to risks linked to climate, which bring about a deterioration of their living conditions and an ever-growing vulnerability. This trend is at the origin of the displacement, but also of migration in the short, medium and long term. And the most vulnerable groups are often concentrated in this grouping because they're in the most uh, exposed regions to the risks of climate, in particular extreme temperatures, floods and drought. According to the conclusions of the intergovernmental panel uh, of experts on climate change, the IPCC, the majority of scenarios show that this increase in temperatures linked to the meteorological uh, conditions are ever more extreme and create existential challenges, in particular in the Sahel region. That's why we have already adopted a framework document of nationally determined contributions looking to 2030, and it defines our national strategy to fight the effects of climate change. This national strategy includes an element for the mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions and an element for adaptation thanks to investments in vulnerable sectors in order to strengthen resilience in our country to climate change. Chair, it is our responsibility to try to anticipate the short, medium and long-term changes of climate, food, insecure, food security and human mobility by identifying the high risk areas so that we can have a reactive adaptation, be proactive in decision making, and ensure that development is ever more resilient. In order to do this, we need to strengthen our collaboration on a regional and international level in order to improve availability and quality of data, which allow us to have good predictions and make prospective analysis. We also need to increase investment in capacity building on a local level. And 
ensure we have long-term adaptation measures which are specific to our context, especially in the sectors of agriculture and herding and to promote livelihoods which are resilient and strengthen food security and act as a factor in mitigating conflict and future displacement. This is the point for me to congratulate the IOM as the lead agency of the United Nations system for migration, which is today in the front line of operational work in research and in raising awareness on migration due to environmental reasons and ensuring it's at the center of international, regional and national fora. In Burkina Faso, we are working with the IOM to assist the national authorities and local authorities to ensure we have better planning, which includes migratory issues and environmental issues in our territories. We look forward to a fruitful collaboration because it's essential now to take into account internal climate migration so that we can have a planning framework for the future which will guide us in a more structural transformation and strengthen resilience of communities that are most affected thank you thank you thank you very much excellency thank you um next on my list uh, the honorable Ian Burrow, minister for foreign and European Affairs and Trade of Malta. You have the floor, Excellency. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to be able to address this 113th session of the Council, especially in this trying time, as we see how effectively address the ever-evolving global migration situation together. Indeed, Malta remains very aware of the challenges that can be faced in managing migration as a frontline state in the central Mediterranean. In 2022, Malta saw the arrival of over 352 irregular arrivals to date. Nonetheless, the situation in the region also remains one of major concern. Irregular arrivals across the central Mediterranean route have exceeded 91,900 this year, an increase of 54% compared to the previous year, 2021. Yeah. By the 13th of November, 1,358 persons were reported dead or missing while crossing the same route. In this context, we must also reiterate our appreciation to the IOM for standing with frontline states and for its long-standing cooperation with Malta, including in assisting the readmission and voluntary return of migrants. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, the COVID-19 pandemic remains a global concern, but we seemed to be moving towards a post-pandemic scenario. Nonetheless, the eruption of other crises has frustrated most efforts to truly start the path to recovery. Indeed, this year has also put a spotlight on a number of other crises, as we have started to see the intersection between climate change, food security, migration, and displacement at work. The unlawful invasion of Ukraine by Russia has displaced millions of people from their homes and created one of the worst displacement crises in years. While the European Union and the international community have done their best to elevate their immediate suffering, we need to consider long-term solutions for those displaced. The destruction of Ukraine's infrastructure will make it more difficult for them to return to their lives. The invasion has also impacted global food security, particularly the people most in need in countries of origin. Worsening this crisis situation is the longer term phenomenon of climate change. We can expect its negative impact on agriculture and worsening natural disasters to push people to move involuntarily. Our region the Mediterranean will be particularly influenced, warming 20% faster than the global average. The interplay between these elements, as well as the lingering economic impact 
of COVID-19 pandemic has created new situations which may push people to be exploited by smugglers and human traffickers. We can expect the situation to worsen in the months, if not years to come. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in this context, we must step up our efforts to ensure that migration remains a choice and not forced upon people in desperation. We must continue to work towards addressing the root causes of regular migration and to tackle migrant smuggling and human trafficking. Going forward, we believe that a global framework for comprehensive migration management remains as essential as ever. Global challenges require global solutions and migration remains a global challenge. We therefore reiterate our support for the UN Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, which was adopted in 2018, and stress the need for its continued and effective implementation. Throughout its long history, it has proven to be an invaluable partner to member states and migrants alike. We look forward to continuing our invaluable cooperation with the IOM and to contribute to the strengthening of the organization for many years to come. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you. Um, next on my list, um, the Honorable Prime Minister of Bangladesh, Dr. His Excellency Dr. A.K. Abdul Momen. You have the floor, Excellency. Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Mr. Chairperson, the Director General, Distinguished Delegates, Assalamu Alaikum, peace be upon you all. At the outset, I thank IOM for its selection of a very pertinent topic for this high level segment. Our government collaborated with IOM twice this year to hold multi stakeholder discussions focused on human mobility in the context of climate change in Dhaka and in Sharm al Sheikh. As a climate vulnerable country, Bangladesh attaches high importance to the interface among climate change, displacement and migration. We strongly feel that the international community should decide and deliver on collective action to safeguard the interest of those I usually refer to as climate migrant, displaced people due to erratic climatic changes. According to the global report on internal displacement 2021, it is estimated that approximately 143 million people will be internal climate migrants around the world by 2050. Among these, 40 million alone would be in South Asia, and one third of these is likely to be in Bangladesh. In fact, as per varieties of estimates, each year, nearly 650,000 people of Bangladesh are being uprooted from their sweet homes, from their traditional jobs, due to erratic climatic changes, such as global warming, additional salinity, river erosion, and the like, and they are crowding, creating slums in the cities and towns. Currently, Bangladesh government is trying to help, help rehabilitate them, but when one third of the coastal belt of Bangladesh will go underwater, and nearly 20 to 30 million people will be uprooted from their sweet homes, from their traditional jobs, the government of Bangladesh alone cannot help rehabilitate them, and they may become a global security problem. Interesting thing is, these people being uprooted from their home, not because of the policies and strategies of Bangladesh government, but because of abuse and misuse of the resources by the polluters. Before such happens, 
it is imperative for the global leadership to take corrective actions. Women, children, the elderly and persons with disabilities will possibly be the worst victims. For them, migration and mobility are increasingly becoming a natural choice for adaptation, and in many cases, the only feasible option. Ladies and gentlemen, our government has therefore underscored in our newly adopted National Adaptation Plan 2022, the need for addressing forced human mobility due to climate change as possible adaptation strategy in connection with the question of food, nutrition, and livelihood security. Our government is already engaged in designing and developing secondary cities or townships with housing facilities and livelihood opportunities for people displaced due to climate-induced extreme weather events. We are also encouraging the regional office of the Global Center on Adaptation that we host in Dhaka to further explore the scope of human mobility as an adaptive response to climate change. The historic decision at COP27 to establish and operationalize a loss and damage fund is an important step in the right direction. We stress that once finalized, the fund should support the vulnerable countries to prevent and adapt to the challenge of climate-induced climate -induced displacement both within and outside national borders. We also emphasize that the procedures for assessing, accessing the fund must be streamlined in order for resource constrained countries to harness benefits from it in the true sense. The launching of the Global Shield Against Climate Risks jointly by G7 and G and B20 has been yet another important move during COP27. Germany, as the leader of G7, and Bangladesh as one of the members of CBF, took initiative uh, for setting up this global shield against climate risks. We reiterate the importance of using such insurance tools for supporting countries and communities affected by forced displacement due to climate change. During Bangladesh presidency of the Climate Vulnerable Forum, or CBF, we facilitated the creation of the B20 multi-donor trust fund to lead by example for such financing mechanism. Ladies and gentlemen, in the backdrop of current cost of living crisis, the issue of food security should also be squarely placed in the discourses of the climate-induced migration. While climate change is severely impacting food production on one hand, the war in Ukraine is augmenting global food insecurity through disruptions in food production and supply chain. In Bangladesh, our Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina has been alerting our people about further aggravating the situation next year, resulting in a possible famine-like situation in many developing and less developed countries. In order to avert such a situation, she has given directives to steadily maintain a certain quantity of food stock, food grain stock, to promote agriculture in fallow lands across the country and to bring 10 million families under discounted food supply coverage and other social safety nets. Owing to our government's multi-pronged efforts, Bangladesh has emerged as a leading producer of rice, potato, fruits, vegetables, poultry, and inland fisheries, freshwater fisheries in the world. Despite our land scarcity and large population, however, our continued efforts at maintaining food security are being severely undermined by climate change impacts, 
especially in our coastal areas. Much of our agricultural land along the coastal belt is now threatened with the growing phenomena of sea level rise, cyclones, tidal waves, and salinity intrusion. In addition, the occurrence of floods, river erosion, and droughts in other parts of the country has also increased in frequency and intensity in the recent years. Our investment to mitigate the impacts of these disasters and hazards continue to strain our resources and often overstretch our capabilities to respond effectively and efficiently. It is generally estimated that Bangladesh GDP would have registered an additional 2% growth rate had it not been diverted to our efforts at the climate adaptation and mitigation. To make matters worse, our coastal city of Cox's Bazaar is hosting 1.2 million forcibly displaced Rohingya, the residents of Myanmar, including at the cost of massive environmental and ecological damage. The international community has a moral responsibility to support countries like ours in a meaningful manner by living up to their internationally agreed commitments for finances and enabling technologies. The deepening geopolitical tension and associated armed conflicts cannot be a pretext for diverting attention and resources from the climate crisis. As a GCM champion country, Bangladesh will continue to flag the economic, social, security, and political risks associated with unmanaged climate migration in all relevant international forums. We shall also maintain our advocacy on the rights perspective associated with this issue in our capacity as a newly elected member of the UN, UN Human Rights Council. To conclude, we hope that this high-level segment will be instrumental in catalyzing comprehensive, integrated, and coherent action for addressing the interlinked issues of climate change, food security, displacement, and migration. We hope that this monument, momentum would be carried forward by the Global Forum on Migration and Development, uh, and Development GFMD, and other relevant platforms towards forming the much needed consensus within the UNF C process. I thank you all. Joy Bangla, Joy Bangabandhu. Thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency. Um, on my list now, I have um, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Peru, uh, His Excellency Mr. Cesar Landa Arroyo. Uh, you have the air, Excellency. Mr. Antonio Vitorino, Director General of the International Organization for Migration. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Republic of Peru, it is an honor for me to speak to you today, the occasion of the 113th Council of the IOM, and to highlight how our country is carefully handling the increase of migratory flows with a steadfast commitment to uphold the dignity and human rights of our migrants and to foster their social and economic integration. Our region has witnessed firsthand the phenomenon of human mobility of those who are seeking out livelihoods, opportunities and a brighter future, who move around to look for new opportunities to ensure their livelihoods. This migration issue is therefore central to the national agenda. More than 60% of our migrants who are non-nationals find themselves in irregular situations, whether that's for reasons of documentation or lack of recording of income. Moreover, more than 3 million Peruvians are living outside of the country where they try to keep the ties between our land against a constantly shifting global context. 
In Peru, we have put in place mechanisms for migratory governance and to foster actions across international fora to craft a common migratory agenda. The Intersectoral Migratory Management Working Bureau, which is a multi-sectoral commission which is provided by the Peruvian Foreign Ministry, is responsible for coordinating, assessing, proposing, prioritizing and supervising policies and actions linked to the migratory management and is seeking out uh, to meet requirements and needs across four thematic axes in the migratory national policy 2017-2025 and these are the following to uh, for those peruvians who are living outside of the country those who return and non-nationals in our country the migratory bureau was included last may during the international um, migration review forum in the un best practice review repository and also like to highlight that Peru has been considered as a precursor country for the global compact for um, safe orderly and regular migration likewise our country is developing with our limited resources in the spirit of solidarity plans and act actions which allow us to meet the basic needs and facilitate the socioeconomic integration of non-nationals across the Peruvian uh, territory sharing our limited resources that we have this is thanks due to the important support of the IOM and other agencies within the UN system in this vein who recognizes the need to continue adapting its institutional uh, framework system in order to facilitate the integration of migrants, the offering of services to them for non-nationals and host communities and the support of the migrant population and the refugee population who are most vulnerable and combating discrimination and xenophobia as ways to guarantee an efficient response to this new migratory dynamic. The Migratory Bureau serves as a guide to improve synergies and joint decision making, acting as a consultation platform and discussion of exchange of views. I'd also like to underscore the complex and multidirectional relationship between migration, the environment and climate change. Environmental factors have an interplay with economic, social and political processes to and have an impact on migratory flows, as well as displacement can be seen as strategies for adaptation and survival um, of the environment in which we live. In this vein, we must focus as on the prevention of forced migration due to environmental factors and to assist and protect those affected populations through migration and to facilitate um, displacement and migratory flows as the strategies for adaptation. Peru has worked to make headway on strengthening preparedness um, with disasters, especially in the cross-cutting risk management across its public policies. The Foreign Affairs Ministry of Peru sees this as an absolutely integral and holistic perspective of its national plan and is active, pa participating actively in national drills of um, large-scale onset disasters with the National Economic Operations Centre, the COEN, and putting in place preventive and response actions with assistance networks and attention with this national and migrant population in coordination with the mission of Peru of the IOM and undertaking binational activities with binational drills with Peru and Ecuador the 23rd of November last year. These proposals are framed by the internationalization of rights-based approach and non-discrimination to, to ensure we have an effective um, uh, meeting the needs of vulnerable groups who are faced with natural disasters. Given the migratory um, regularization, this is a first step towards the socioeconomic integration. This is granted through a humanitarian migratory quality, and we're putting in place documentation campaigns across different areas of the country, which are developing on a communication strategy in order to combat xenophobia and discrimination, making the use of best practices which have been developed by governmental institutions, UN agencies, and international banks and civil society. From its regional perspective, and last 14th of November last, we have taken up the role of the presidency, um, interim presidency of the South American Conference on Migration, and we will spare no effort to promote the harmonious work and coordinated approach to face the challenges of migration across the region and to develop integration and reintegration um, mechanisms which are effective for our migrants. In this vein, we will continue with the and we count upon the invaluable support of the technical secretariat of the conference through the regional office of the Americas in the southern region for the international office of migration. And I'd like to close by promising the full commitment of Peru to work jointly for safe, orderly, and regular migration to wish you every success of this upcoming council. Thank you. 
Thank you, Excellency. Thank you very much. Um, my list, I have um, Honorable Tobias Linda, Minister of State at the Federal Foreign Office, Germany. Thank you so much, Chair, Director General, Ministers, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. To quote, the challenges and opportunities of international migration are a given and must unite rather than divide. Those were your words, Director General, and in the same vein, and you said that to quote, only through international cooperation and partnership can we hope to respond to mounting humanitarian needs and advance the goal of safe, orderly, regular, and dignified migration grounded in human rights. Ladies and gentlemen, we could not agree more. On behalf of the German government, I would like to thank you, Director General, for your leadership to ensure that IOM is fit for purpose. And I would like to thank all of IOM staff who assist people in need every day. We highly value our excellent partnership and cooperation with IOM. And I thank you for the opportunity to address the IOM Council today. I would like to make three points regarding our partnership and IOM's work against the backdrop of current global challenges. First, we see a global increase in hazards and disasters related to climate change, leading to new displacements of millions of people every year. This is dramatic because in situations of displacement, people are not losing only their homes. They are losing much more economic security, community, and maybe even whole cultures. The physical and mental health impacts are a severe consequence of such traumatic events. This is why we need the International Organization of Migration more than ever to help families who lost their homes in context of disasters and climate change, to help those who are displaced to cope with the situation or to help them to adapt to a new place. I thank IOM for clearly addressing the urgent need to tackle these challenges at the COP27. My second point, ladies and gentlemen, today is on IOM's institutional capacity. We have to acknowledge that IOM, like other organizations, faces many crises at the same time, such as violent conflicts, especially Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine, food insecurity, and the ripple effects of the COVID pandemic. All of these crises impact on displacement, migration, and human mobility dynamics around the world. In combination with the negative impact of climate change, IOM is truly facing enormous challenges. IOM is immensely important in this current landscape and needs to have a sound financial basis. Ladies and gentlemen, we have come a long way and agreed on the important budgetary reform. This reform will enable IOM to make the necessary investments to strengthen its core structure. Considering the steady growth of the organization, this will help to streamline its efficiency and visibility. Cooperative partnership is at the heart of IOM. The adoption of IOM's budget reform shows its impressive ability to cope with and master challenges, and we thank IOM's leadership for seeing this through and the member states for your hard work towards this outcome. What we will have to focus on now is the implementation of this, this achievement in order to guarantee that IOM can continue to fulfill its current and future tasks as humanitarian and development organization. Germany is fully committed to deliver on its responsibilities to move the budgetary reform from theory to practice in order to further strengthen IOMs as the lead UN agency for migration. We are prepared to deliver our increased contribution to IOM starting in 2023. Again, ladies and gentlemen, IOM is central for the assistance of people in situations of the displacement around the world. While the project-based structure of IOM's operations has many advantages, it leaves little room for a quick response when a disaster strikes or a conflict suddenly escalates. To address this gap and to secure IOM's responsiveness in emergencies, Germany established a global flexible funding mechanism for humanitarian emergencies with IOM. For this year, we already provided 6.5 million euro to this mechanism helping IOM to provide tarps and ropes to flood affected populations in Pakistan to respond to the cholera outbreak in Lebanon or to provide shelter to migrants in the Darian Gap. This is of course on the top of our flexible humanitarian funding for the African continent or for Ukraine. 
I would like to invite the present member states to join us in this flexible funding effort so that the IAM team can react with full force in all stages of crisis. My third and last point is on IDPs and the importance of safe migration possibilities. IOM's assistance to internally displaced persons has been key to meet the greatest, greatest needs of millions of IDPs. For all of us, the continuously rising numbers of IDPs worldwide are extremely worrisome. Therefore, we are in full support of the focus on durable solutions that the Secretary General has established through his action agenda. We take this action agenda very serious and stand ready to support IOM on the implementation route. Looking at migration, we know that this is an important coping mechanism. It is very worrisome though, that too many migrants have no access to regular pathways, leading them to embark on dangerous or even deadly journeys. The global compact on migration remains a cornerstone for common principles and objectives to manage migration in a safe, orderly, and regular manner. We strongly believe that the GCM provides a strong basis for our cooperation from which all we all will benefit. We commend IOM for its leadership as a coordinator of the UN Network on Migration and the implementation of the GCM objectives. Germany will continue to support IOM in this important role and to contribute to the Migration Trust Fund. We believe that next to traditional donor fundraising, and telling the success stories of the fund, we have to take additional steps. One new instrument could be a matching pledge scheme, which Germany would be delighted to pilot. By collaborating with a new donor, existing donors could increase visibility and ownership of the fund. We are looking forward to discussing the details of a matching pledge scheme in the near future. Going forward, we also need a better understanding of the dynamics of displacement and migration movements especially in the context of climate change. In this respect, the systematic collection, analysis, and use of relevant data is key. The foundation of the Global Data Institute is very timely in that regard, and we are glad to support the GDI substantially. Last but not least, as a cross-cutting topic, we would like to commend IOM for paying tribute to the fact that women in all their diversity represent half of the human potential to drive development, stability, and economic prosperity. And while substantial progress has already been made, big gaps remain and we can achieve more by working together on this issue to further strengthen equality. Therefore, Germany remains committed to a feminist foreign and development policy. I thank you. I thank you, Excellency. Um, next on my list is um, his Excellency, Mr. Enric A. Manalo, Secretary of Foreign Affairs of the Philippines. Excellency, you have the floor. Yeah. Director General Antonio Vitorino, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. The Philippines recognizes the role of the IOM in protecting the rights and welfare of migrants and other people on the move. IOM has earned for itself an international profile of having a robust and impactful presence on the ground, and its personnel and aid workers have maintained a strong presence in displacement situations in Ukraine, Ethiopia, Afghanistan, and other parts of the world. At a time when climate change and food security have contributed to increased migration and displacement, the global community needs robust international organizations. The IOM, working within the development system of the UN, should be able to carry the banner of its core advocacy, migrants. It should support tangible projects, including through capacity building programs with meaningful national ownership. With the Migration Multi-Partner Trust Fund as a reliable vehicle in driving such support, the Philippines has been its supporter, donor, and recipient. During its time as an MPTF Steering Group member, the Philippines pushed for projects related to climate change and migration, part of our responsibility to heed the call of the times. 
the Progress Declaration of the International Migration Review Forum articulates that climate change, environmental degradation, and natural disasters are among the drivers of migration. It recognizes that for us to mitigate and adapt to the adverse effects of climate change, developed countries must scale up climate finance. This call for action, for climate action and climate justice, cut across all multilateral fora and must be at the top of the agenda, not just in the UNFCCC platform. Our work in the IOM necessarily requires an understanding and acceptance that we are in a climate emergency. If we envision to protect migrants and people in vulnerable situations and uphold the human rights of all, we have seen firsthand how the IOM has played its critical part in responding to climate and disaster-induced displacement through the delivery of swift humanitarian assistance. IOM has been a reliable partner of the Philippines in disaster resiliency and disaster response as countries like ours cope with extreme weather conditions and natural hazards brought about by climate change. We appreciate how IOM has supplemented the Philippines' disaster risk reduction management and response. To have an effective role in preventing and responding to climate and disaster displacement, IOM should find its niche within the broader local, national, and international ecosystem. This means working with national authorities, local governments and communities, and coordinating with other UN and international organizations to ensure that initiatives consider the most efficient use of manpower and resources and are not duplicated. In Geneva and New York, the IOM can continue to build partnerships, including with related groups and existing initiatives the Platform on Disaster Displacement and the International Data Alliance for Children on the Move. We are encouraged that IOM and the UNHCR can seamlessly collaborate on mixed movements through the recently signed Framework of Engagement. We can explore how to level up coordination with the UNDRR and participate in the upcoming midterm review of the Sendai Framework in May 2023. For the Philippines, both climate change and food security are existential issues which affect the lives of more than 100 million residents and more than 10 million Filipino migrants all over the world. Natural hazards have increased in intensity and frequency, placing a strain on our economy, including adversely affecting agricultural harvests, threatening livelihoods, damaging critical infrastructure, and displacing rural communities. Just last month, a severe tropical storm made several landfalls in all 17 regions of the country, affecting more than half a million families, causing the loss of lives and damage to agriculture. It is for this reason that President Marcos has placed agriculture, climate change, and disaster risk resilience among his priorities. We aim for inclusive development, so that for Filipinos, migration will be a choice, not a necessity. This means less structural inequality, more economic options, reduced vulnerabilities for women, children, indigenous peoples, and persons with disabilities. We therefore endorse the organization's recognition of and response to the intersections between climate change and food security with migration and displacement. We are committed to supporting the IOM in implementing the aspirations of the Global Compact on Migration, the Progress Declaration, and the Institutional Strategy on Migration, Environment, and Climate Change 2021 to 2030. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Excellency, Honorable Minister. Thank you very much. Um, Next on my list is uh, His Excellency Mr. Carlos Rafael Faria Tortosa, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. You have the floor, Excellency. Thank you, 
Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Thank you very much, Chair. To this council, I bring you warm greetings from the President of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro Moros, and we thank you for the invitation to this uh, multilateral and cooperative uh, meeting looking at uh, international migration. We are speaking today to speak about important subjects which are affecting our society and which we want to deal with immediately issues such as climate change, which is aggressively growing throughout the world with devastating consequences on the planet, migration, the production of food, and the everyday reality of peoples. President Nicolas Maduro recently at the COP27 referred to climate change and said, the climate crisis is an unassailable reality that can only be confronted with concrete action which is urgent and immediate. We need to have real and effective action agreed, but we also need to design straight away a specific agenda to assist vulnerable populations in the planet. Migrants are, of course, amongst those. And another subject that calls us to this council is food security, which is essential to raise the living standard and well-being of peoples with full dignity. Food is a full right, and we must take care of our actions to ensure the production of foodstuffs, avoiding global warming, which has not been provoked and caused by the current developing countries, we need to fight and mitigate the devastating effects of climate change. We need to look at internal displacements and defend the rural populations that produce our food. We guarantee the food security of our people as a fundamental part of our development model. Despite the many aggressions that our country is exposed to, we are producing 80% of our food and we have progressive potential to ensure we are self-sufficient and very soon we'll be able to export food to contribute to eradicating hunger that millions throughout the world still suffer from. But in order to achieve a full life and ensure the food for all populations, we need to take real and effective action, which will work for our planet and guarantee a dignified life for now and the future. As a consequence of the illegal application of the coercive, unilateral coercive measures, Venezuela has seen many internal mobilities and displacements and uh, forced migration outside our territory. This has been due to political ends, to dislodge our constitutional government and change our participative democratic model. There are attempts to destroy our development models. For decades in Venezuela, we have received millions of migrants without any discrimination, without xenophobia and with full integration Today, Venezuela is still the warm and safe home for millions of migrants from all parts of the world, where they find economic prosperity, social inclusion, education, housing, and healthcare. In our country, more than 12 million migrants have contributed to our development. Our country has millions of brothers and sisters of other nationalities who have been included socially and are fully enjoying their rights without any discrimination. In Venezuela, we have never used our open arm policy to move forward our political interest as other countries have done, as certain governments in the region in Latin America and the Caribbean have done, and also beyond our territory. We have not used migrants to form coalitions of countries to attack as Venezuela is attacked on the migration of our nationals who were forced to leave our territory because of the application of more than 700 criminal unilateral coercive measures that we have been subject to. Venezuela has not driven and will never drive 
interagency platforms and aggressive propaganda campaigns to to remove the prestige of people and will never use migration politically for financial resources in the face of donors organizations that have uh, used political ends and have used it for trade since 2015 systematically the economic war of political and economic blockades has led to an economic migration of our citizens who are now voluntarily returning after being frustrated and being victims of false promises which in many cases turned to xenophobia discrimination over exploitation in working hours low pay discrimination and lack of decent conditions and no social security in their places of destination and it's recorded for history that foreign governments whose heads of state moved to our borders to bring about violence in a constant way they invited our nationals to leave with documents that had expired even without documents and then they closed their doors requesting visas they even broke off diplomatic relations with venezuela leaving our nationals stranded without being able to receive assistance from our government in even in transit countries it is intolerable and immoral that there be attempts to use humanitarian arguments or to take advantage of vulnerable people to advance destabilizing agendas and to profit from human suffering an important outcome to highlight to this council is that despite all the harmful impact of the unilateral coercive measures on our country's uh, economy we continue making every effort in our government and overcoming barriers to ensure that hundreds of thousands of our citizens have returned and continue to return on a daily basis voluntarily what are the reasons for the return without doubt a great deal of frustration because of the conditions that are not favorable in countries they arrived in or where they spent some time I would like to share with you the extraordinary experience that we have seen in the last four years, which is our Plan Vuelta a la Patria, the return home from Nicolas Maduro, which will facilitate the dignified return of many of our citizens who were robbed of their fundamental rights and victims of xenophobia and discrimination, social exclusion, and we recall that many of our migrants did so because of the negative media campaigns and false propaganda, which was politically aimed against the state of Venezuela. They tried to start uh, migratory processes in the worst conditions to talk about a situation that's not real in Venezuela, where they worked for the right to refuge and in venezuela they they are saying that in venezuela there is conflict that forces people to flee in the face of the challenges of migration like other countries we recall that migration is a human right and we cannot face the challenges alone that is why we believe in inclusive multilateralism trying to seek out consensus, the union of peoples with respect, sincerity, transparency, solidarity, and cooperation for the well-being of migrants in their countries of origin, transit, destination, and safe return. We would like to highlight the importance of the Global Compact for safe, orderly, and regular migration, a multilateral agreement which has actions and commitments which are specific for the progress of migratory flows and it wants to build and contribute to the governance of migration by nations and to ensure the well-being of migrants whatever their migratory status with our bolivarian diplomacy of peace 
We want to fight against the criminalization of migrants and their families, the political using of human mobility. We reject in this order any approach that wants to see migration as a business. And we call on the public prosecutors to look at the funds for international migration. We want accountability of the millions that have been collected. This needs auditing. Chair, to end, I would like to mention that the migratory phenomena that uh, come about because of the aggressive actions against our population and in meeting our constitutional obligations, laws and treaties, Venezuela is expelling as part of its policy, is carrying out a policy which will favour regular stays, integration of all non-nationals in society in Venezuela from the moment they arrive. We have experience in drawing up policies which are socio-economic and favour and benefit migrants from receiving them and we help them to integrate into our national life without uh, any conditions based on their migratory status. All citizens residing in the territory of Venezuela benefit from our public policies of the revolution were expressed in our social missions and which include the areas of healthcare, education, housing and many more. These are good practices in the approach to migration. Recently, the National Commission for Migration was uh, launched to update, modernize and strengthen migratory policy in our country and to ensure assistance of all migrants is provided. We look forward to the cooperation and uh, technical assistance of the IOM to help us build our internal capacity, our consular work, so that we can assist migrants in a safe, orderly return. Venezuela would like to take this opportunity to repeat before the member states of this council its uh, willingness to be open to dialogue, to constructive work, agreed on the basis of solidarity between countries, be they countries of origin, transit, or destination, or return to not politicize migration and the agencies and international organizations working on the subject. We will contribute to strengthening the organization and implementing policies, as well as achieving better agreements for the benefit of migrants, which will look at all diversity and success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency. Um... We, I have on my list, um, Her Excellency Ms. Anna Katrina Mendes, Minister in the Cabinet of the Prime Minister and for Parliamentary Affairs of Portugal. You have the floor, Excellency. Thank you, Mr. President, dear G Director General, dear Antonio Vitorino, dear colleagues, distinguished delegates, allow me to begin by saluting the decision of Director General and Vitorino to present his bid for a second term on IOM's DG. The Portuguese government strongly supports the candidacy of Antonio Vitorin for a second term. This decision mirrors the consistent priority given by Portugal to a humanist approach to migration and to multilateral cooperation. In this first mandate, in a particularly challenging international context, Antonio Vitorino achieved important results in strengthening the organization and its budget. He implemented reforms to the top management structure, promoted geographic and gender diver diversity, and established evaluation and accountability mechanisms, while improving the effect effectiveness of human activities. For these reasons, we believe Antonio Vitorin deserves to be given the opportunity to implement on a second mandate the reforms that he led on his first term. Furthermore, Portugal supports a second term of the current DG as it has always been the case 
with all these predecessors in IOM and as also contributing to the indispensable rotation of leadership amongst all region, regional groups, giving all of them a fair and balanced change in running the organization. Dear colleagues, it is my pleasure to join, join you today for a discussion on this major challenge for the global community. The intersection between climate change, food insecurity, and human mobility. We welcome its increased visibility on the political agenda and for the first time mentioned on the conclusions of COP27. In today's multiple and interconnected crisis, it is key to recognize and address the complexity of population movements driven, driven by climate change. Although most of the mobility occurs within, within the borders of countries, an increasing number of people will be forced to move abroad. While more visible in some regions and countries, this affects the whole planet. Climate changes affects the life, uh, li livelihoods of populations, undermining the ability of already vulnerable economic and social systems to cope. Water scarcity and sea level rise lead to lower crop produ productivity in regions where agri agriculture is the basis of employment. Coastal countries, particularly small islands, nations have their livelihoods threatened. Due to climate change, some areas of the planet become inevitable. Food and energy rising prices following Russia's war against Ukraine have exacerbated food insecurity with a strong impact in the most vulnerable communities. How to respond is the question. We need to support small-scale uh, farmers, policies that balance urgency and sustainability, an ambitious energy transition, digital and green transitions, while advancing social fairness, decent work and social protection. It is crucial to strengthen efforts to enhance and diversify pathways for safe, orderly, and regular migration. With that in mind, we should aim at one, supporting people on the move by concluding labor mobility agreements, optimizing education opportunities, and facilitating access to procedures for family reunification. Second, helping people to stay by addressing the adverse, adverse clima, climate climatic the drivers that compel people to move, making migration a choice. In the case of Portugal, migration in both directions has been a defining factor for social change over decades. As champion countries of the GS GCM, we set safe and sustainable migration as a priority, both at home and abroad. Migrants play a vital role in our communities and provide positive contributions both in countries of origin and destination. Despite the challenge of over the past years, our commitment to a, new, to a humanistic approach to migration has not faded. We sign bilateral labor mobility agreements with partner countries in all continents to facilitate legal and safe labor migration flows, including a mobility agreement among the member states of the community of Portuguese-speaking countries. Dear colleagues, we must set up, set up our efforts to mitigate and adapt to the adverse effects of climate changes. I hope we will continue to work for a world where human mobility becomes driven only by choice and not by lack of other options. And where choosing to migrate implies a safe path to the destination. We, you, you can continue to count on Portuguese, Portugal engagement and commitment on this. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Excellency. Um, next on my list, I have uh, the Excellency Mr. Pana Wrightis Mitarachi, Minister of Migration, Asylum for Greece. That was close enough. Uh, thank you, Director General, Excellencies, distinguished colleagues. It's a pleasure to be here for the 113th session of the Council, and we should encourage more colleagues to come in person next year, as fostering dialogue is important in Council and in the sides of the Council to improve our global understanding. I would also like to wholeheartedly thank IOM for his active support to Greece during the difficult decade of the migration crisis. Antonio Vitorino personally and his team has been very effective, working with us in areas such as unaccompanied minor facilities, camp management, healthcare provision, integration programs, and voluntary returns. Ladies and gentlemen, the world is facing numerous serious interlinked challenges, such as climate change, overpopulation, food insecurity, and displacement. We welcome the action taken by many states, and we encourage more action to be taken in these fields. The outcome would be obviously of such challenges that increased migratory pressure would occur. We need to prepare for the needs of the time in a coordinated and organized way, providing humanitarian and development support to countries in need, providing for humanitarian visas when required, and very importantly, providing for legal migration pathways. Greece is prepared to participate in joint efforts to mitigate the consequences of these issues as long as these efforts are coordinated in accordance with international law and the responsibilities are fairly and equally shared. Last year, we welcomed, for example, 843 Afghan female dignitaries in Greece with humanitarian visas. We welcome more than 100,000 displayed people from the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Migration is a collective challenge and no state can address it alone. We're working with our European Union partners to agree on a new pact on migration and asylum. Still much work is needed, still problems arise. But Europe is determined to work together. Greece has for the past 10 years been at the forefront of managing disproportionate migration flows compared to the capacity of the country. In order to manage migration flows, we have enacted a strict but fair migration policy. Our policy centers are protecting our borders and controlling irregular migration in line with international law, as well as opening up pathways for legal and orderly migration. We want to offer legal pathways to people in need, people seeking employment in Europe, offering opportunities through bilateral agreements. We have entered agreements recently with Bangladesh and Egypt, and we're working with many other countries to establish similar agreements. We're ready to participate in joint initiative for humanitarian admissions, as we have done in the past, as I mentioned, the case with Afghan dignitaries. But let me be crystal clear in one important issue. We will never permit smugglers, people making money from human suffering, to dictate who enters Greece and the European Union. It is a national priority to track down and dismantle such smuggling networks. Many use the asylum path as an employment route to Europe. It is critical that we preserve the integrity of the asylum system and the Geneva Convention, providing asylum to those entitled to international protection, but returning with safe and dignified manner those that come irregularly and not eligible for protection. We look forward to continue our cooperation with the International Organization of Migration, and we will encourage a review of the UN system, focusing on op the opportunities to merge resources and capabilities in the field. Thank you. Thank you so much, Excellency. Um, as someone whose last name seems stubbornly unpronounceable, even in my own region, I do work hard to, um, to pronounce names right. Thank you. Um, I have, I believe, um, oh, Capovado, um, Minister of Communities, His Excellency Mr. Charles Santos. Um, Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you. Sr. Director General, the OEM, Dr. Antonio Vitorino, Mesdames et Je salue I greet the authorities and all the participants in the 113th session of the IOM Council. 
for the relevance of the subject, a debate on the correlation between climate change, food security, migration and displacement. Looking at the new global scenario of conflict, war and pandemic, which is differs a great deal from the goals of eradicating hunger, food insecurity and all forms of malnutrition by 2030. These were all agreed and we're all invited to reflect and find the way of growing resilience and adapting to climate change and to adopt a food system that protects our planet. Cabo Verde, as a small island state with a medium level of development uh, and uh, where the, with the lowest uh, greenhouse gas emission rate in the world, is faced with structural constraints uh, of various types, which make it a very vulnerable country. And as a consequence, we need to rapidly adapt to the changes we are seeing. The consequences of climate change in the archipelago put at risk the years of progress in terms of sustainable development of our country. The COVID-19 pandemic and the energy crisis linked to climate change have uh, seriously worsened the vulnerability of our country. Cabo Verde has uh, decided to make uh, a state policy of mitigation of climate change effects, and we're making every effort to minimize the impact of climate change through full policies to reduce the impact on food security. And we need to look at the measures of compensation for producers of food products throughout 2021-22. Uh, Cabo Verde is a stable country, a peaceful country with a respect of human rights, with a national population of around 500,000 inhabitants. And we have a diaspora estimated of 1.5 million residents in Europe, America, Africa, and other parts of the world. The government's vision in Cabo Verde was to face the new challenges by providing safe responses linked to migration. The High Authority for Migration was set up in 2020 to provide a better integration of the migrant uh, communities in Cabo Verde and in 2021 we set up uh, a ministry which makes the diaspora central for our work with connections to the community. Our experience as a country, a member of ECOWAS and the group of uh, small island developing states of, is very aware of the negative impacts of climate change on our economy and the direct consequences for populations. And we have worked on political decisions and to ensure we have measures to make us resilient to climate change. So support and financial mechanisms must focus on the specifics of the most vulnerable country groupings to 
develop programs for a green economy, the blue economy, and renewable energies, as well as a digital economy. Labor force migration must be accompanied by an assessment of the social impact and the impact on the environment of the countries where people migrate to other countries to ensure their survival and to guarantee their human rights. Ladies and gentlemen, it is clear that a small island developing state such as Cabo Verde can access financial global finances so we welcome the creation at the cop 27 of a fund for loss and damage with the aim of compensating countries which do not significantly contribute to climate to, to global warming but which suffer the most from the effects of climate change so to conclude i would like to repeat our call on the international community to look at the possibility of transforming debts of small island developing states into climate investments in the areas of education, healthcare, the fight against poverty and inequalities. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you very much. Um, next on my list, I have the Right Honorable Andrew Michel, uh, Minister of State for Development and Africa, United Kingdom. You have the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you to the IOM for focusing the conversation on the implications of climate change for migration. It is my pleasure to speak on behalf of the United Kingdom and I'm sorry that I'm not able to join in person. The World Bank estimates that 216 million people could be displaced by climate change in Africa and Asia alone. This pressure is being compounded by conflict and lasting impacts from COVID-19. Russia's unprovoked and illegal war in Ukraine has driven more than 14 million people from their homes and threatened global food security. Discussions about migration and climate change are too often held in isolation rather than recognizing the links between the two. I welcome the IOM's leadership in making sure we are talking about and confronting these issues in the round. Better adaptation to climate change will lead to fewer people having to leave their homes. Which is why at COP27, the UK committed to triple funding for climate adaptation from £500 million to £1.5 billion. Migration should also be seen as a form of adaptation in and of itself. So it is important that countries and the IOM work together to make sure these movements are safe, orderly and regular. We commend the work done by the IOM to bring migration into the discussions at COP27. Migration is too often seen through the lens of loss and damage or implications for refugee policy. This is too narrow a focus and frames migration as a threat. Instead, it should be part of the discussion on adaptation and inclusive development. We must build stronger links between partners working on climate issues, humanitarian need, development, and migration. So as we look towards COP28 and the future work together, I would like to suggest a few principles for us to consider. First, let's recognize the leadership role that the IOM can play. The UK government welcomes the proposed new UN network on migration climate work stream, which will bring together the UNFCCC and ILO to work on this issue. You can count on our support. Second, we encourage IOM and member states to integrate climate perspectives across their migration programs 
and vice versa. This will lead to better understanding and management of the challenge. And third, we must build structures and policies that provide long-term solutions. These must be integrated across migration, development, climate and humanitarian sectors. Through cooperation and joined up action, we can overcome the climate change migration challenge. Thank you. Thank you, um, Excellency. I have um, His Excellency, Mr. Alhamdu Ag Ilieni, Minister for Malians Broad and African Integration. Mali, you have the floor, Excellency. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for me to take the floor on the occasion of the 113th session of the Council, which I will hope will allow us to take stock of the actions undertaken over the last year and to exchange views on the visions for our organization. Allow me, on behalf of the highest authorities of Mali, to convey our sincere gratitude to Ms. Antonio Vitorino, Vitorino, the Director General of the IOM, and to his entire team for the extraordinary efforts undertaken in the area of migration. Ladies and gentlemen, like in 2021, Mali's agenda is rich in the area of migration with the constant support of IOM. Our common commitment has allowed us today to identify and meet the priority needs of the protection of the most vulnerable migrants against the backdrop of a security crisis in some host countries. Our partnership with IOM has allowed us to rescue since January 22 and to date more than 5,000 Malians in a situation of distress and to bolster the migratory governance framework. I'm particularly heartened to note that our common efforts have elevated Mali to the status of a champion country in the implementation of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly and Regular M Migration in December 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, significant headway has been made over the last year, yet challenges remain. And that is why I am of the view that this Council session will give us an opportunity to cast a sharp light on lasting solutions. Among the challenges that remain, there is the persistence of irregular migration, which is a real scourge for our young people. Against this backdrop, our efforts must focus on more intense communication and tireless outreach against the risks and dangers of irregular migration. Moreover, combating smuggling networks and implementing, implementing integration opportunities for young people must continue apace. Moreover, it is important that we continue to innovate towards the reintegration of returning migrants, implementation of community projects and technical and financial support for diaspora projects. Ladies and gentlemen, in Mali, the combined impacts of conflicts and the persistence of terrorism and climate change are affecting the populations and forcing them to move. And this has an impact on their livelihoods. It is therefore imperative and urgent to invest in prevention in order to address the climate change effects on human mobility. We absolutely must have a multilateral approach in order to overcome the challenges of mobility. Ladies and gentlemen, it would be remiss of, remiss of me to end if I were not to thank the head of the Bureau of the IOM mission in Mali and his team for their excellent work and all the support they work towards the protection of migrants in a situation of distress and to give them socioeconomic support. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Excellency. Um, I have now His Excellency Mr. Paul Mavina, Mabima, Minister of Public Service, Labour and Social Welfare, Zimbabwe. You have the floor, Excellency. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Chairperson, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, Zimbabwe would like to begin by congratulating the Bureau for its deserved election to preside over the 113th session of the IOM Council. 
we join delegations who have spoken before us in offering our support to the chair, Your Excellency Ambassador of uh, Sierra Leone, Mr. Lansana Gabriel. And we are confident of your ability to lead this council to a resounding success amid the various challenges confronting the world today in the area of migration. Chairperson, we welcome this high level discussion focusing on the topic, the intersection of climate change, food security, migration, and displacement, which follows the historic and recently concluded COP27, successively hosted by the Arab Republic of Egypt. As the world continues to grapple with the unprecedented effects of climate change, Africa has been adversely affected, bearing the brunt of natural disasters that have worsened the poverty situation and led to a decline in water resources and water quality. Regrettably, as a result of climate change, agricultural productivity has decreased, infrastructure has been damaged, and lives have been lost. The tragedy is that the many countries, including my own, most livelihoods depend on the natural resources that are threatened or are depleting due to climate change. Indeed, there is an overwhelming concern regarding migration and increased human mobility in Africa, given that the nexus between migration, environment, and climate change is highly complex. Migration is largely a response to various environmental factors, and climate change has compounded the issue of migration. It is in this regard that the dynamics of climate change, coupled with population changes and migration, with their intricate relationship with development, today constitute the most pressing challenges that are restraining Africa's socioeconomic development discourse in recent years. It is therefore crucial for member states and the IOM to understand these complex interlinkages between socioeconomic and environmental triggers of migration to ensure informed decision-making processes and the creation of viable pathways towards sustainable migration in Africa. Furthermore, it is imperative for us to collectively take action and tackle the risks associated with climate change, migration, and forced displacement. Strong collaboration will enable us to provide solutions to the various challenges confronting the world. And in our case, leverage Africa's Agenda 2063 to open up opportunities and harness the full potential of migration in relation to the socio and economic development of both the sending and the receiving countries. This high level discussion therefore offers an opportunity to share best practices on viable policy actions and options towards mitigating the effects of climate change on migration and forced dis displacement. Chairperson, climate change induced migration is expected to increase and in the process causing horrendous uh, humanitarian challenges, prime among them food insecurity. Risk reduction measures should be put in place to support resilient communities in the face of climate change. It is our considered view that building climate resilience would best be done by designing and implementing solutions in an integrated manner that includes hard infrastructure measures, nature and government-based solutions, as well as utilizing community-based practices. Climate change related disasters, such as uh, heat waves, floods, cyclones, and persistent droughts 
We have dire implications for food security, availability of water, health, and general socioeconomic development. This impact on human uh, mobility, in addition, the climate change clearly under, it undermines our quest to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals and Africa's Agenda 2063 due to the destruction of lives and livelihoods, population displacement, and disruptive movement within and across borders. Chairperson and your excellencies, Zimbabwe has put in place measures to provide sustainable social, uh, social protection services to the vulnerable populations, including survivors of natural disasters, as well as victims of the forced displacements and irregular migration. In 2022, a total of 3.6 million uh, food insecure people were provided with food assistance in Zimbabwe due to climate induced food crisis. In its response, the government of Zimbabwe is working closely with the World Food Program and other development partners to provide food assistance to at least 3.8 million vulnerable people during the 2022 to 2023 consumption period. These will be complemented by cash transfers to strengthen the household economy and build resilience within the communities. In conclusion, Mr. Chair, the intersection of climate change, food security, migration, and displacement has far-reaching implications. It demands collective effort to address the myriad challenges and to drive benefits from safe, regular, and orderly migration. We call upon the IOM to strengthen its collaboration with related agencies and continue to facilitate capacity building initiatives in member states in efforts towards risk reduction and disaster preparedness. In addition, their cooperation between and among states should also be strengthened given that natural disasters transcend national borders. I thank you, Chair. And I thank you very much for the warm words of support and encouragement. Thank you so very much. Um, Excellency, uh, I have uh, Mr. Scott Harris, Associate Deputy Minister of Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada. Canada, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, Excellencies and distinguished guests, I'd like to acknowledge, acknowledge that I'm honored to join you today from Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. As some of us are attending this high level vir segment virtually from different parts of the world, you may be joining us from traditional lands of different Indigenous peoples. I encourage you to learn more about the Indigenous peoples of the land you reside on. On behalf of the Government of Canada, I'd like to express appreciation for the opportunity to discuss the connection between climate change, human mobility, and the many essential things we all need to live together in our society, like adequate income and access to food and housing. We greatly value the important role the international order of migration plays as a convener and facilitator of our global efforts to deal with these complex issues. The IOM's recent international dialogue on migration was an exceptional opportunity to hear from experts across organizations and agencies and from rep representatives of the affected communities. Climate-induced instability and displacement have grave physical and mental health impacts on affected populations, particularly on those who are disproportionately affected and made even more vulnerable. We've heard the call for proactive investments in preparedness, resilience, and adaptation capacity, and we're exploring how we can best engage. We've reflected on the urgency of creating early warning systems to improve emergency preparedness in developing countries, particularly the small island developing states. We know climate change can be a threat multiplier. As it interacts with political, social, economic, and demographic factors, it can complicate and aggravate existing tensions and conflicts, political instability, and food insecurity. This ultimately leads to increased human mobility, 
Thus, climate change has reshaped and will to continue to profoundly reshape migration and displacement patterns within and across borders. At home in Canada, we are not immune to climate change and its impacts. We've experienced severe weather events such as hurricanes, flooding, coastal erosion, wildfires, and permafrost thaw. We must collaborate with those who are most affected to find timely and effective solutions to this crisis the whole world is facing. Canada takes a whole of society approach to climate action and implementation. We seek out diverse voices and perspectives to deliver on our climate goals and address the root causes. We welcome the increased international attention to this issue, including at COP27 in Sharm El Sheikh, where migration and displacement were featured more prominently as the human face of climate change. We're also looking forward to working together to develop an action plan for nature over the next decade at COP15 next month in Montreal. We commit to standing with local, national, and international human organ human humanitarian organizations and working together, including to help people adapt to the impacts of climate and environmental change. There has been significant progress in advancing regional discussions and experimentation to address some of the most pressing questions about human mobility in the context of climate change. Many countries have planned ahead and explored regional solutions, such as Fiji's progress in developing its standard operating procedure for planned relocations. This is a good example of a whole of government approach. I'd also like to note the Intergovernmental Authority on Development and the East African Community who signed the Kampala Ministerial Declaration on Migration, Environment and Climate Change. This declaration, together with the Protocol on Free Movement of Persons in the region, are notable examples of regional collaboration that can help respond to the pressures of disasters and climate change. We're keen to learn from those who have been creatively advancing solutions in this space. As a champion country for the global compact for safe, regular and orderly migration, Canada reaffirms the importance of the compact to address migration and displacement in the context of climate and environmental change in all its complexity. We encourage global efforts to address the limitations of current migration and adaptation systems. We also appreciate the need to develop better solutions for those on the move and for those who want to stay, bearing in mind that specific affected groups may face particular and acute vulnerabilities. Therefore, promoting safe, regular, and orderly migration pathways is critical as are increasing adaptation capacity and developing disaster risk reduction strategies so that migration remains a choice and not a necessity. Canada's commitment to making migration one of many possible solutions for people affected by climate change. We are investing in adaptation and resiliency efforts in climate change affected countries through the international climate finance efforts. These include addressing biodiversity loss through nature based solutions and helping countries already impacted by climate change transition to sustainable climate resilient and inclusive development. We are taking a gender responsive and human rights based approach to international assistance. We are focusing our efforts on addressing fundamental structural barriers that prevent gender equality, while taking into account the needs of those most affected by multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination. 
Canada has consistently advocated for an inclusive and gender responsive approach to migration management to amplify the voices of women, girls and gender non-conforming people, as well as others who face discrimination or marginalization. We aim to help protect their agency and support their empowerment. Mr. Chair, in closing, Canada would like to reiterate your appeal for urgent action on a defining issue of our time, climate change and human mobility. The IOM's clear vision and commitment to collaborate across humanitarian development and peace nexus in a strategic response to migration crisis is imperative, and we stand ready to assist in this important work. We appreciate everything the IOM has been doing to address human mobility in the context of climate change, and we thank you for bringing this topic to the front of international, regional, and national discussions. Canada looks forward to continuing our engagement on this topic. Thank you for the opportunity to address the Council today. Uh, thank you, Canada. Thank you very much. Um, I have Her Excellency Ms. Nicole de Moor, State Secretary for Asylum and Migration, Belgium. You have the floor. Dear Chairman, Director General, Excellencies. Okay. Climate change is one of the most important crises of our time. Every year, millions of people around the world suffer from cyclones, floods, desertification, and rising temperatures. This year alone, millions were affected by the ongoing drought in the Horn of Africa and the European continent. Floods devastated large parts of Pakistan and Nigeria. To deny that this has an important impact on migratory movements would be irresponsible. According to the World Bank, more than 260 million people worldwide may be forced to migrate due to climate change by 2050. There are already twice as many forced displacements due to disasters than due to conflict. Moreover, migration is a source of loss and damage, a topic also discussed during the recent COP27. And finally, climate change acts as a crisis multiplier for those that are already displaced. Quite obviously, in the long run, a continued commitment to the Paris Climate Agreement is the best guarantee to minimize forced human mobility. But to mitigate the effects of the damage that is already done, and to adapt to new, new realities, this topic needs to remain high on the political agenda. I wish to thank IOM for taking the lead in this discussion. In Belgium, climate change has been a priority in foreign policy and development cooperation since 2008. Belgium made more than 700 million euro available for climate financing in the period 2013 to 2020, a sum that was increased to 138 million per year in 2024. Financing will be focused on the most fragile and least developed countries, particularly in Africa. More than 50% of it is dedicated to adaptation. Through the capacity building in the Sahel and in Central African countries, Belgium aims to reinforce climate resilient agriculture, ecosystem restoration and the sustainable management of natural resources. Youth and gender perspectives are central to the Belgian approach, as this is a connection between peace and climate change. For that reason, Belgium joined the Climate, Environment, Peace and Security Initiative, which seeks joint responses to climate-related risks to peace and security. To grasp the scale of the challenges ahead, a more holistic approach is needed. And indeed, more needs to be done to bring the climate community and migration community together. Data collection and early warning systems have to be integrated in policy analysis and responses. Those data should feed mechanisms for conflict prevention and be aligned with tools during humanitarian interventions. Finally, a holistic approach includes looking at migration as an adaptation strategy for the negative impacts of climate change. One could imagine the creation of temporary and circular migration schemes to assist climate-induced migration. During the absence of the migrant workers, environmentally fragile land can recover, allowing marketable crops to start growing again. As a lawyer, I cannot but conclude my intervention today 
without pointing to the necessity to back this holistic approach by a solid legal framework, allowing for orderly and organized migration in this context. Once again, I wish to thank IOM for tabling this topic during the high-level segment of what is, once again, a successful Council meeting. I thank you. I thank you, um, Excellency. I have um, His Excellency Mr. Abdi Rahman Abdi Shakur, Special Presidential Envoy for Drought Response, Somalia. You have the floor, Excellency. Dear colleagues, chair, and fellow speakers, distinguished guests, it's my great pleasure to join you all in this high-level segment, the 113th session of the IOMO Council, which is an opportunity to reflect on impact of climate change on food security and displacement on future migration. Food insecurity is a growing global problem, and it's becoming a greater contributor to displacement and migration. With only eight years left to achieve the sustainable development goal of zero hunger, one in 10 people do not have enough to eat. Conflict, geopolitical crisis, climate change, and raising price of food and fuel are playing key role in the global food emergencies. And all four, along with underlying fragility, limited investment in resilience and infrastructure, an increasing population of vulnerable and displaced people are causing unrelenting problem for my country, Somalia. Last 30 years, my country has experienced 31 droughts, floods, and other climate disasters. The usual adaptation method have reached the limit, forcing an estimated 209 million people to be internally displaced in major towns and cities of my country, Somalia, is now the most urbanized country in Africa. And with it, the potential for increasing rates of displacement driven by climate-linked disaster will only increase as situation continues. Additionally, livelihood value chains and main productive sectors are currently not adapted to the climate change, making them a significant driver of displacement. With a failed fifth rainy reason, uh, season, the current drought is the worst in 40 years. About 7.8 million people are already affected. 300,000 are at risk of the falling, in, falling into the famine, and 1.8 million under the age of five are facing acute malnutrition. The drought also caused a significant reduction of crops, 70%, and the death of more than 300 million livestock. The scarcity of resources driven by the climate is also a threat to the country's peace and stability, and it's leading to an increased risk of the intercommunal violence and forced recruitment of the youth by extremist group. But despite the current challenges we are facing, Somalia has been on the path of development and stability. As a result of institutional and financial reform, the peaceful transformation of power early this year as well as the establishment of the federal member states demonstrated our political progress. Somalia has also been able to maintain economic stability and participation in the HIBIC, highly, heavily, heavily indebted poor countries initiative to seek that relief, expected to be completed next year. And in, in, and in recent months, our government with support of local communities has made great advances in the fight against the Al-Shabaab terrorist group liberating more and more areas. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, Somalia is among the least contributors to the cost of the climate change, but the deal is, is dire consequence. We become victim of some, something which we had not contributed to. Climate induced displacement, uh, displacement and migration is now becoming a new normal for Somalia. The millions displaced of mi all migrating into the refugee and ID becomes requires support to cope with the new reality of climate change. To address the migration, we have to address the inevitable loss and damage arising from the climate change. The life-saving humanitarian support we get to respond to, emer to the emergency situation like one country currently affecting my country is much appreciated. 
but it cannot be a permanent solution. As climate change intensifies, we are determined to build the resilience of our people to adapt and mitigate the climate reality and its fallout. To achieve that, we need a stable, reliable, and predictable funding with, with a dedicated approach, such as tailored financial mechanism and resources allocation criteria that are simplified and it is fit for context of the conflict. This, this will improve Somalia's chance to access funding for adaptation program and allow more local actors in Somalia to independently access climate finance. Our government cannot do this alone. International partners with government, with governments, diaspora, private sector, and technical experts are vital. At the recent COP27 decision was made on new funding to response and address to climate change loss and damage taken into the account of displacement. This new funding commitment are timely for the Somali and we are hopeful they will contribute to break Somalia out of this ongoing cycle crisis. The goal of our government is a beautiful Somalia where no one is going hungry or lack, or lack access to essential services and where people only migrate out of joys. I thank our partners for their ongoing support and urge the international community to further engage in the crisis response and not let the possibility of averting the worst outcome pass by. We need polluting countries also to cut their emissions so that the goal of the Paris Agreement 1.5 Celsius can be achieved. Helping vulnerable families cope with climate change will bring us closer to ending hunger in Somalia, to our country becoming a contributor to the food security and sustainable energy production and ensuring that stability and life and, and life and livelihood opportunities are available for our younger people at home. We know that we have immense undertaking ahead of us. Discussions like this are important step to save lives while mitigating the effect of climate change. I thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Um, I have now uh, Ms. Ezra Zia, Under Secretary for Civilian Security, Democracy and Human Rights, United States of America. Excellency, you have the floor. Distinguished delegates, Chair, I appreciate the opportunity to speak on behalf of the U.S. government on the intersection between climate change, food security, migration, and displacement. We appreciate IOM's work in supporting communities to improve the resilience of people at risk of climate change and migration impacts while meeting critical humanitarian needs around the world. President Biden's 2021 report on the impact of climate change on migration outlines US government efforts to anticipate, prepare for, and respond to climate-related migration. It also explores our efforts to scale up support to migrants, as well as sending and receiving communities. This includes integrating climate and migration policy and programming. The United States has a long history of standing in solidarity with people affected by climate and weather crises, as well as other complex emergencies. The effects of climate change and food insecurity on migration and forced displacement are significant. Drought, flooding, wildfires, and extreme weather events all contribute to displacing people from agricultural areas and can spur and amplify conflict. Moreover, they increase the number of food insecure migrants and increase malnutrition in vulnerable migrant populations, especially children. Across the globe, Climate impacts are placing additional stress on communities already facing food insecurity, limited economic opportunities, social or political marginalization, conflict, and poor governance, including uneven or inequitable delivery of services. Marginalized groups, especially women and girls, older adults and disabled persons are disproportionately affected by climate crises food insecurity, and displacement. It's critical that we keep key gender inclusion and protection concerns at the forefront of all response efforts. Comprehensive solutions must not only contribute to climate resilience in affected areas, but also strengthen safe options and offer protection as appropriate for those who leave. 
As a global community, we are now at a point where we need to move beyond discussions of the severity of the crisis and onto concrete action to implement the necessary solutions. President Biden's emergency plan for adaptation and resilience, better known as PREPARE, was announced at COP26. It aims to help more than half a billion people in developing countries adapt to and manage the impacts of climate change. Through PREPARE, we're investing in early warning systems, increasing agricultural climate resilience in least developed countries, and helping promote climate smart agriculture and food systems. PREPARE also builds on the White House report on the impact of climate change on migration by addressing key drivers of irregular migration. We're responding to displacement, supporting those who choose to move as a risk management strategy, and assisting trapped populations. The United States is committed to improving the well being of people who migrate or are displaced by climatic events, as well as the people and the communities that receive them. To cite just a few examples, the United States is contributing $5 million to the Migration Multi Partner Trust Fund, or MPTF, for climate affected migrants. We're scaling up humanitarian food assistance globally, contributing nearly $6 billion to the World Food Program and fiscal year 2022. This includes ready to use therapeutic food to quickly and effectively address malnutrition in the most impacted populations. We're supporting research programs in Asia, Africa, and the Western Hemisphere on the impact of climate change on migration to inform policymaking and supporting regional programs at IOM to strengthen diplomacy to place climate change and migration on the agenda of regional consultative processes. In addition, the United States government is committed to providing safe legal pathways for those seeking to work in the United States. The H-2 Seasonal Temporary Worker Visa Program is an important pathway that mitigates irregular migration and provides economic opportunities to workers and their families. Keeping in mind the intertwined nature of climate change and food insecurity, we've also invested in efforts to improve the climate resilience of food systems through expansion of our Feed the Future program to eight new target countries and through contributions to the International Fund for Agricultural Development and the Food and Agricultural Organization. In closing, I thank you again for this opportunity to discuss the many new coordinated lines of effort to address the impact of the climate crisis on migration and forced displacement. I look forward to future collaboration on these significant issues. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. I now have um, His Excellency Mrs. Sazakov, Deputy Chairman of the State Mig Migration Service, Turkmenistan. Uh, you have the floor, Excellency. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, dear Director General, it's a great pleasure for me to meet you here at uh, our 113th meeting. We would like to wish you all uh, good results. Uh, we would like in this respect uh, to in this respect, to mention that we are now a full-fledged member of your organization, and uh, we we take uh, special measures uh, in this regard, uh, in full respect of human rights. Uh, climate change affects uh, virtually all aspects of human life, of human activities, be it health or, or employment. Uh, in this respect, uh, mobility of population is a major factor. Starting in 21, we have been facing uh, a difficult situation, not only because of outward uh, 
migration, but especially when it comes to internally displaced people because of climate and the environment related factors. We need special help so that we now can help our affected people. Dear Director General, dear colleagues, my country is uh, ready to work uh, with all other countries in order to reduce uh, the emissions of greenhouse uh, gases. Uh, we have been developing uh, activities in order to train our own national experts, uh, and we are now involved uh, in uh, climate-related mapping of our territory. We are developing our own uh, action plan in this respect, uh, taking into account uh, what is going to happen according to forecasts. Uh, we must uh, react uh, accordingly. I think we need internationally developed uh, recommendations uh, which is especially important to the countries uh, that are part of a armed conflict. Uh, we should uh, think about what could be done in this respect. Uh, we are committed uh, to the Paris Agreement. Uh, we agree with the final document adopted uh, quite recently in Egypt. Uh, we think that the most important thing is uh, to use the new technologies uh, that could help us uh, to overcome these difficulties. That includes uh, energy, and we have a new law on the renewable sources of energy. On top of it, uh, we are involved in planting millions and millions of trees uh, all over our country. All this in due respect of our Paris commitments. Uh, we would like to say that uh, we, the government of Turkmenistan, is committed uh, to the commitment of uh, drastic re reduction of uh, green gases uh, emissions. Uh, we are working on this uh, both internally and regionally as well on a global level. We think that uh, our national uh, program uh, could help us uh, in terms uh, of problems related to the Aral Sea this is a major source of concern. Uh, the fact uh, that the water level is going down very fast, uh, we think uh, that the international fund uh, to save the Aral Sea is a major decision. We should take into consideration uh, the threats that we are facing in this uh, respect. Uh, we need uh, to enforce uh, our initiatives in order to reduce uh, climate-related uh, risks. In a way, uh, migration related uh, to uh, climate change is one of uh, major activities. We are working uh, on uh, this uh, issue. We do see the linkage between migration and climate uh, change. Uh, we need uh, to work uh, in order to implement uh, our decisions uh, taken by our government after consultations with the representative office of international organization for migration that we have in our country we think that climate related research the mapping of our legislation in terms uh, of its coordination with international commitments and international law is a very important uh, 
activity. We would like uh, to mention uh, a new law that uh, has been recently adopted in my country, the law on the arrangements for international uh, assistance. Dear colleagues, uh, Mr. Chairman, we are committed to the development of our work in the area of environment in order to prevent unwanted migration. We will cooperate in constructive manner with all international structures we are sure that this will uh, result in better efficiency we have uh, already a major document which is a global pact i think uh, that this is uh, a major factor together with the uh, paris uh, agreement we would like to strive uh, for better understanding and increasing uh, the health of our world. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thank you, Excellency. I have uh, High Excellency Ms. Jean M. Sendeza, Minister of Homeland Security, Malawi. You have the floor, please. Person or members' deaths represented in this session, members of the press, ladies and gentlemen. It is with great honor and privilege that I join you today for the IOM 113th session of the Council. Noting that this session provides an opportunity for us all to share the realities and reflect on how human mobility patterns are influenced by climate change, food security, weather security, environmental security, and livelihood security. Let me start by highlighting that mostly we as a country are faced with challenges in facilitating safe, orderly, and regular migration. Chairperson, we are living in a world on the move that more people have migrated and many have been displaced in the world today than in any other time in recorded history. Displacement and migration are two entities that are as old as humankind. Migration has been labeled as the oldest poverty reduction strategy and is a key to a world tune with itself. The motives for migrating are multiple and complex. People migrate and are displaced due to global demand for workers at all skills levels youth in need of jobs, social economic imbalances, digital revolution that has brought instant communication and information desperation for survival, natural and man-made. Human mobility is inevitable. In view of the driving forces in an interconnected and inter uh, interdependent world, unfortunately, the world at at present is in disarray and finds itself in the middle of migration and displacement storm. An unprecedented series of simultaneous complex and protracted crises, conflicts, and humanitarian emergencies in the Horn of Africa has resulted to more displacements and migration crises that has resulted to deaths of those on the move before even reaching their intended destinations. Chairperson, as we face the continuation of simultaneous, unprecedented, and complex emergencies, member states need to address the root causes actively and promote commonly shared values and interests. It is my prayer that member states will thoroughly reflect on these issues in this meeting and come up with a common position on addressing these matters. There is need for uh, in integration and collaboration in order to promote safety of the displaced persons and regular migration 
and help mitigate irregular migration with the challenges it brings to us. Turning to migration challenges into opportunities for all requires effective migration management systems and interventions that go beyond national borders. Recently, there has been a high rise of displacements due to climate changes and displacements due to conflicts. And Malawi has not been uh, left out on these, and it has experienced the hurricane Gombe and it has also hosted some people from its effects. It has also uh, further been a host to those uh, affected by displacements due to conflicts. These pose a great discomfort to those affected, especially women and children, as they are usually exposed as vulnerable groups in such situations. Malawi is at a point where the environment for the displaced persons is in great crisis as there is very limited provision for food, water, and livelihood for the displaced po populations due to changes and dwindling funding. This poses a great risk to the country as it also has challenges making provision for the host population. It is my prayer that this session will indeed allow member states to come up with common resolutions that will be lasting and tailor-made to address all the challenges connected to human mobility. Further to this, let me join others in making a call to member states and international partners to ensure we put measures in place to address negative effects on the environment and climate in dealing with both regular and irregular migration. In conclusion, let me sincerely thank International Organization for Migration for the support, financial support that is uh, rendered to Malawi on all issues to do with migration and also for this opportunity to share and learn from others on how to address the challenges that are affecting human mobility in this day and age. I thank you all for your attention. Person? Uh, and I th thank you, uh, Excellency. Thank you so very much. We are running rather an hour, about an hour behind schedule, which is surprising since we started so well this morning. Um, I guess you can run up this to seven. I, I still have a, quite a few names on my list. We'll take a few and see how we do with time. But there is a reception later on. Um, so let me take um, the European Union. Her Excellency Ms. Eva Johansson, European Commissioner for Home Affairs. And then we'll see how many more we take before we have a break. Thank you. You have the floor, EU. Your Excellencies, Honorable Guests, Director General of the IOM, dear Antonio. Russia is bombing Ukrainian power plants, the gas and water supply, and the goal is clear. In the words of a Russian State Duma member, if you have no water, no electricity, no sewer, we expect an immediate flood of refugees towards the western borders. That's what he said. How calculating, how callous, how cold-hearted can you be to freeze, starve and terrorize civilians with the aim of provoking a refugee crisis and boast about it on national TV? This must be the first time in the 70-year history of the International Organization for Migration that a state not only causes a refugee crisis in wartime, but wants to do so deliberately, consciously, cynically, and is proud of it too. These war crimes will bring no victory, but only shame to Russia. I've been to Ukraine. They won't surrender. They are fighting for their homes, their families, for the survival of their nation. 
and the European Union will continue to stand by Ukraine as long as it takes. We will continue to welcome refugees from Ukraine. Ever since EU member states agreed to my proposal to activate the Temporary Protection Directive, giving more than 4 million Ukrainians immediate protection, access to employment, health care and housing, and almost 700,000 Ukrainian children seats in our classrooms. And don't believe Putin's lies. We welcomed not only Ukrainians, but everybody fleeing Putin's war. Hundreds of thousands of people from all around the world. And our commitment to the global community remains as strong as ever. Russia's war of aggression threatens to cause hunger and starvation. We opened EU-Ukraine solidarity lanes so Ukraine's grain can keep flowing. We welcome the renewal of the Black Sea Grain Initiative. And we support the Grain from Ukraine initiative launched on Saturday. 60 grain ships to prevent starvation caused by Putin's war for Sudan, Somalia, Yemen, and many other countries. And we reserved 8 billion euros for food security worldwide. And I'll intensify my work to build mutually beneficial migration partnerships. Last year, we provided 1.5 billion euro to help manage migration and force displacement. We can only manage migration if we work together with our partners, like the Western Balkans and Turkey and the many African countries I have visited. And just two weeks ago, I went to Bangladesh and Pakistan. We discussed protection of Rohingya and Afghan refugees and, of course, the effects of droughts and floods. So I'm proud that the EU is sharing the platform on disaster displacement with its focus on climate change. We work with many of you, countries of origin, countries of transit and of destination, to fight the smugglers, to help people return and reintegrate, paving the way for more regular migration so people don't have to risk their lives to come to Europe. Just today, I am hosting a high-level forum on resettlement. And next year, in the European Year of Skills, we will focus on learning and labour mobility. Migration is something normal, which we can manage, but we can only manage it together, in the spirit of the Global Compact, and with the International Organization for Migration and its crucial contribution to help face challenges today. In Ukraine, in Europe and around the world, you can count on our continued support. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you very much. Um, I have now um, Ms. Christine Schrana Brogena, State Secretary for Migration. Switzerland, you have the floor. Monsieur le Président, Chair, Director General, Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, climate change has and will continue to have undoubtedly a significant impact on population displacement. While the real scope on migration is quite difficult to predict as yet, here, I would like to underscore three aspects. Firstly, the importance of data. Whilst climate change and environmental degradation have impacts on population movement, it is difficult to quantify this precisely. We must also acknowledge that migration and forced displacement have multiple causes and interact with a large spectrum of factors which, working together, force people to displace themselves. Experts agree that population movements will continue to grow and that this issue could become one of the largest global challenges for the future. That is why it is absolutely critical to better understand the phenomenon in all its complexity in order to meet adequately 
this challenge. For example, developing early warning systems and protecting and assisting those people who are involved in this. Switzerland is also particularly interested in having a better understanding of the impact of slow onset disasters on migration and displacement. Secondly, we would like to underscore the need to act in the area of prevention. On one hand, in order to reduce the risks and the impacts of natural disasters, and on the other hand, to combat against climate change in order to stem its harmful impact. The President of Switzerland has underlined within the framework of the Heads of State Summit of COP27, the implementation of the 2030 Agenda is our common goal. Switzerland remains convinced that it is the duty of all states who have the capacity to support those countries who are most affected by climate change and by environmental degradation. And that is why Switzerland will uphold its goals despite the current challenges in the area of energy. Parallel to this, against the framework of our mandate of the Council and the Security Council of the UN for 2023, Switzerland has earmarked as one of its thematic priorities to take into account climate risks on security and peace. Thirdly, allow me to insist upon tangible action in the short and medium term to address displacements. The recent international dialogue on migration underscored the importance of migration governance. This is a priority area for Switzerland, which is reflected in its cooperation with a number of countries and regions of origin and transit. In this vein, we are happy to see that IOM has included the climate and environmental questions in its program on training entitled Essentials of Migration Management 2.0. We are very proud to have contributed to this development and drafting and to broaden its scope by funding of this document into French translation. The challenges posed by climate change and food insecurity and their impact on displacement can only be addressed together through reinforced partnerships. This conviction will only bolster our commitment to improve the protection of those persons who are forced to leave their region or their country of origin due to environmental degradation and climate change effects. In addition, Switzerland is focusing its efforts of international cooperation in order to address climate change through the following. Firstly, adaptation and strengthening of local resilience, for example, through a better management of natural resources or the application of agroecological practices that are lasting in nature. Secondly, emergency assistance and protection for persons who have been displaced is particular through lasting solutions and thirdly the use of a migratory tool by supporting the creation and strengthening of safe orderly and regular regular migratory, migratory pathways lastly switzerland is act actively participating on the platform on displacements linked to disasters. This mechanism had allowed us to better predict displacement, prepare for them and meet the, uh, the needs of those who are finding refuge either in their own country or beyond its borders. So thank you very much for your kind attention. No, thank you, uh, Switzerland. Thank you. Um, I have now His Excellency Mr. Dafa Allah El Haj Ali Usman, Under Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Sudan. You have the floor. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Sayyid al-Rais Antonio Vitrino, Mudir al-Aam, Le Munozamat al-Hijrat al-Dawliya, 
أصحاب السعادة السيدات والسادة Director General Chair Thank you It is my pleasure at the outset to commend the efforts of IOM and its uh, judicious management and the critical role played at the international level and all the multilateral work undertaken and its positive role to meet the urgent needs of affected populations chair we are here today in geneva in order to discuss the effects of climate change on food security migration and displacement and in sudan we stand convinced that the relationship between all of these issues is a natural uh, partnership in Sudan. We see these effects at first hand, particularly as we are among the more affected countries affected by climate change. Over the last few years, climate change between torrential rains, flooding in certain regions, droughts in others indeed. All of this has pushed thousands to leave their homes of origin in order to find new livelihoods in different regions, or even to emigrate beyond Sudan in order to find a dignified life. This displacement has caused amongst others, tensions between populations from different ethnic backgrounds because there is competition on the agriculture and water areas. This has led to violent and armed conflicts and has increased the number of IDPs, particularly in Darfur and other regions. Chair. The increase of the number of IDPs, which has gone beyond the figure of 3 million persons and the negative impacts of climate change on displacement and migration, the figures show the scope of damage with which many people are facing due to the heavy flooding in regions across Sudan in 2020. Once again, this year, this has also occurred. More than 500,000 people have been completely or partially affected. 100,000 have been displaced following the heavy rains that destroyed their agricultural land, their homes, and which were their very means of survival, their livestock have indeed perished. This situation underscored the importance of measures to introduce in order to address these climate challenges as best we can, especially measures for adaptation, which are fit for purpose, including policies and strategies to guarantee food security and to strengthen food production and to provide drinking water and to implement early warning systems which are efficient and which are able to uh, provide the data and necessary information in order to implement mitigation and adaptation programs that are efficient in the time frame required chair sudan has been extremely active in all international meeting and fora which are seeking to find solutions to climate change issues and as current uh, president of the i get organization which is trying to strengthen um, 
solutions across the region to meet the climate change issues which have led to displacement and migration of a large number of, of people across our region. This issue will be a topic for discussion at the Ministerial Conference of Countries of the IGAT countries, which will take place in Khartoum on next Wednesday, the 30th November 2022. And also in this vein, and given the importance that we have forwarded to climate change, um, we will participate in the, uh, we have participated in the COP27 meeting, which took place in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt recently, recently where our president reiterated the alignment and the importance of the Paris Agreement and the importance that Sudan affords to this very agreement. We also participated in parallel meetings during COP27 in the uh, Green Middle East Conference and reiterated once again the resolve of Sudan to provide and to spare no efforts in order to implement all initiatives given international cooperation in order to address these global challenges, in particular climate change and food insecurity and displacement. Moreover, we attach great importance to all the regional international agreements which seek to meet the and address the issues of climate change on migration and food security against this backdrop the the summit which took place in algeria last week in early november with the league of arab states here we discussed the issue of food security and adopted the Sudanese initiative in this respect. This is an extremely important initiative for not only our country, but for the whole region and the, the, the world as a whole. Sudan is a uh, country for many migrants to pass through and a destination country as well. We are in a situation of where migrants meet and uh, mix. Climate change for us is very clearly linked to other issues in particular migration and organized and non-organized migration, licit and illicit, which uh, which is being forced by climate change. That is why we appeal the, to the international community to provide us with the necessary assistance, assistance in order to strengthen our capacity building in terms of log logistics and technical areas so that we can address these challenges and these phenomena in order to find a solution to the root causes of this issue. Thank you very much, Chair. And I thank you um, very much, Sudan. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you. We have um, um, four, wait, I suppose four countries remaining on the list, and we'll have to take them all in large part because um, we are really honored by their presence in here. They're not speaking online. So thank you so very much. Um, so kindly, let's be patient and, and, and listen to our, our kind, um, distinguished um, uh, visitors. Um, I have Ms. Aino Lepid von Veren, Director General, Department of International Organizations and Human Rights, Estonia. Uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, Chair, Director General, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, it's an honor to participate here today and to address you on behalf of Estonia. The topic of today's high-level meeting is so challenging and pertinent as ever. The science is clear. Climate change is happening and we see the effects everywhere. Droughts, floods and wildfires have all become more extreme. Sea levels are rising 
glaciers are shrinking. Three weeks ago, at the beginning of COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres rightly said, the clock is ticking. We are in the fight of our lives. We are on a highway to climate hell with our foot still on the accelerator. With this grave reminder, he also called out for international solidarity across the board. Uh, solidarity is surely needed as the impact of climate change reaches far beyond natural disasters and state borders. Large parts of the global south are hit particularly hard by the effects of the climate crisis. The most vulnerable people in different parts of our planet are being, are being driven from regions and countries, their homes, because it is becoming unsustainable, impossible even, to live there. Their livelihoods are destroyed, food insecurity is increasing. Estonia and our neighbours in the global north might seem not to be affected by migration and displacement caused by climate change. Yet, it is in the Arctic where environment and ecosystems are affected more severely than any other part of the world, being the fastest warming region on the planet. Still, it is global instability, conflict and decreasing resources fueling by climate change that urge us all to act now. The world needs to pay more attention to how to increase the resilience of communities affected by climate change so that people do not have to make the difficult decisions to leave their homes. Anticipatory action is also crucial in addressing climate crisis phenomena as climate-related natural, natural disasters can often be foreseen and thus their impact reduced. Given the interlinkage between climate change, food insecurity and migration, a new approach is called for. We need to apply the humanitarian development development peace nexus approach to address the global challenges that we are facing. At the moment, Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine has triggered the worst refugee and humanitarian crisis in Europe since the Second World War. It, it has also caused an energy crisis, leaving millions of people in a situation of energy poverty and demonstrates that the reliance on fossil fuels is a precarious choice in every way. Achieving climate neutrality by transition to renewable energy is a, a desired way forward. Estonia, has completely dependent, Estonia was the completely dependent on our local fossil fuels only 30 years ago, but we are now working for the transition to take place. Estonia now produces 50% of electricity from renewables and we plan to double it by 2030. Innovation and smart solutions play a key part in Estonia's path towards climate neutrality. Our experience could benefit to global climate action and green transition. Moreover, today, well, today's world should not be a world where millions of people do not know where their next meal will come from, or hundreds of thousands of people face famine-like conditions. Russia's war against Ukraine has worsened dramatically the global food security crisis, as Russia has weaponized food and hunger since the very beginning of the war. Ending the Russian aggression is the most effective way to restore stability in the global food markets. To conclude, Estonia is keeping the climate ambition high and we are committed to supporting those most vulnerable to climate change. We are financing the export of green technology solutions and know-how to developing countries. 
We firmly believe that all indigenous communities should have a strong voice in discussions on tackling climate change. I would like also to commend IOM for tackling this subject matter as at this high level session and for reminding us how interlinked climate change is with migration and food security. Thank you for your attention. No, thank you, Excellency, thank you. Um, I have now Ms. Um, Mary Akopian, Deputy Minister of Inland Affairs uh, for Ukraine. Excellency, you have the floor. Thank you, dear Director General, Chairman, colleagues. On behalf of Ukrainian government and the Minister of Internal Affairs of Ukraine, it's my pleasure to greet the esteemed participants of 113th session of International Organization for Migration Council. I hope that our today's meeting will become another step for the development of international cooperation between participant, participating states in the priority areas of migration policy. I also express gratitude to all the participating states and IOM leadership for their support, for their positive attitude toward to citizens of Ukraine who were forced to end up abroad. Your assistance and support is extremely important for our Ukrainians during the last nine months. Due to the armed aggression by Russian Federation, commenced on Fe February 24 of this year, Ukraine faced new challenges and need in the sphere of migration as the war has led to humanitarian crisis and the largest wave of migration of our citizens, both within and outside the state. On these days, we honor the memory of the victims of Holodomor of 1932-1933 in Ukraine, so Ukrainians went through the genocide and today we are doing everything possible and impossible to stop Russia's new genocidal policy. And we don't just repeal aggressions. Step by step, we are creating a system that will stop aggression, dismantle its con consequences and guarantee long-term security, security for Ukraine, for Europe and the whole world. Food security is one of the key elements of global stability, and this is where Ukraine has a leading role. Thanks to our presidential export grain initiative, Grain from Ukraine, we sent about 12 million tons of food to the 40 countries around the world. As part of the UN food, se food security program, we help countries where people are literally starving or on the verge of starvation. All of us, not just we, are sending Ukrainian agricultural products to countries that suffer the most from the food crisis, but also we reaffirm that hunger should not be used as a weapon again. For Ukraine to provide food to the world, Russia must keep face with the commitment and in a brut brutal war and constant attacks to critical Ukrainian infrastructure. If it weren't for Ukraine, Ukrainian food, social stability in such re regions as North Africa or the Middle East would not have been maintained, which, is, which actually Russia intended. I also would like to know that currently about 174,000 square kilometers of Ukrainian territory remain potentially contaminated with the explosive objects, with different type of explosive, even that one which is, uh, which is not allowed by Geneva Conventions, which makes up to almost 30 percent of the country's area contaminated and should be demined. This in the endangers the new sowing campaign and further food supplies to the countries of the world. In order to avoid new famine as Russia seeks, it's necessary to demine the territories of Ukraine in a short time in order to carry out sowing for the next harvest. As at the beginning of hostilities, one and a half million Ukrainian citizens who left the temporarily occupied territories of Donetsk, Luhansk, 
Crimea were registered as internally displaced person. At the same time, as of October 2022, there are four and a half million internally displaced persons registered. According to the IOM estimates, as of end of October 2022, the number of IDPs in Ukraine totals six and a half million people. As reported by Office of UN High Commissioner for Refugees, between February 24 and beginning of the November 2022, 15, more than 15 million people uh, crossing uh, the border, uh, Ukrainian citizens crossing the border, leaving the country uh, recorded. In case of continuing Russia's missile attack on the territory of Ukraine and destruction of infrastructure, the number of citizens of our country who will be forced to leave their homes will increase many, manifold. Mostly people move to safer Western regions of Ukraine. The main problems they are facing are lack of housing, job offers, etc. That's what's forcing some citizens to leave Ukraine and depart to foreign countries. At the same time, following the liberation of the territory of Ukraine from Russian occupiers, some citizens return to their places of residence in spite of the fact that this may be life-threatening for them. The enemy army mined everything on its way while retreating, ranging from ordinary tripwires to anti-tank mines, concealed not only the roads, but also the houses of civilians and even kids' toys. The destruction of the infrastructure of cities and villages, constant attacks on energy facilities are the main factors for the increase in the numbers of migration of citizens, both internally displaced and those who went abroad. Moreover, these attacks affect to provision, um, provision of food, medicine, providing medical care, etc. to the population. Constant missile strikes make it possible to restore infrastructure and return citizens to the normal lives. People are in a cold, cut from heating, electricity, water and gas supplies. Ukrainian doctors perform extremely complex surgery, surgeries on even um, including heart surgeries um, in cold premises with no light, placing flashlights on their heads and without hot, hot, hot or cold water in, in uh, medical facilities. Given the present circum circumstances in Ukraine established as a result of the armed aggression from Russian side against Ukraine, leading to the largest migration of Ukrainian citizens outside the border of our state, Ukraine is interested in the utmost observance of the rights and freedom of Ukrainians abroad, and most importantly, in return of its citizens after the Ukrainian victory. Recently, the Minister of Internal Affairs taking care and trying following all the citizens who is staying uh, in uh, EU member state and other countries, we um, provide um, mobile uh, migration offices um, uh, in Poland and Czech Republic to, uh, to, for issuing new documents to our citizens in exchange for expired documents. And you know that many of our citizens leave the country without any kind of do documentation. Ukraine is grateful to all of our partners for their assistance and uh, all that support and treatment for, of Ukraine for protecting protecting rights and freedoms for opening borders to Ukrainians in the most difficult times for our, our country. In addition, Ukrainians are waiting for real action and help in overcoming the terrible challenging facing us this winter. Well, looking forward to further enhanced cooperation, thank you for opportunity to address Council today. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you very much. Um, I have on my list now um, I have Chile and then Argentina is the last on my list. Um, 
His Excellency Mr. Rodrigo Donoso Malouf, Director General, Consular Affairs, Immigration, and Chileans Abroad. You have the floor, Excellency. Thank you. Warm greetings to the Director General, the Chair of the Council, and the distinguished delegates present at the 113th session of the IOM Council. The Secretary General of the United Nations qualified climate change as a red alert for humanity, and he called for a climate solidarity pact which will allow rapid implementation and real action to reduce emissions and limit global warming below 1.5 degrees centigrade in compared to pre-industrial levels it's very relevant that we identify the relationship between climate change uh, food security migration and displacements given that environmental changes interact with other factors be they political economic and geographic and they influence the decisions that individuals and their families take to leave their place of origin and uh, the level to the extent to which it's voluntary or not today we know that around 30 million people were internally displaced uh, due to climate change factors in 2050, it is expected to be more than 216 million people who will be forced to, dis to leave and migrate for climate change reasons. And of those, 17 million will take place in Latin America and the Caribbean. It's clear that migration for environmental reasons st has stopped being an isolated subject and is now of international concern. It has gone to become part of the political agendas of countries and governments on a national, regional, and global level. I would like to highlight eight points on how we see the situation from South America's. One of the external axes of policy for Chile is referred to the commitment of uh, raising in all multinational bodies uh, matters that relate to climate change from a multi-dimensional multi point of view and they have the traditional matters of the protection of the environment and we call this the turquoise uh, policy because it covers marine ecosystems another aspect is that we are leading efforts in the region through initiatives by the creation of a coalition of the americas for the protection of the ocean which establishes an interconnected network of protected marine zones from canada right down to chile in addition we are driving the creation of a climate change observatory which has a network of sensors from the extreme north of our country down to the polar station in Chilean Antarctica. We then if I go on to the fourth point within the specific area of human mobility Chile has a human mobility and climate change roundtable which has been developing national guidelines for public policy within the dynamics of human mobility in the context of climate change and natural disasters and i'd also like to mention the work that uh, chile is doing to drive the use of uh, liquid hydrogen fifth point within the framework of uh, the pro tempore chairmanship by chile of the 20th south american conference on migration we achieved major progress along with 12 other countries we worked on the area of uh, environmental migration and uh, i'd like to highlight that this is the only consult regional consultative process that looks at this in a systematic manner chile wanted and decided on the need to work and progress on the generation and exchange of disaggregated data on cross-border movements uh, which are due to climate change and this is happening across the south american region we are also working on regional guidelines uh, in the area of protection and assistance of displaced persons across borders and migrants in countries that are affected by this disasters 
and we are working in conjunction with the platform on disaster displacement. I would also like to highlight that countries, members of the South American Conference on Migration have uh, subscribed to a joint position statement uh, to the COP27, where we call for cooperation from the international community when it comes to the realities of the South American region in the specific subject of human mobility. And we're already preparing our positions for COP28. We welcome the efforts that are being made to tackle human mobility in the context of climate change at the recent COP27 under the urgent need to put into practice a set of agreements that uh, the international community has reached uh, with specific action for local, national and regional contexts. Uh, and we'd like to uh, call on everyone to go further into depth on the cooperation between the IOM and the South American region for the development of guiding policies to assist and protect uh, migrants and families who are most affected by the adverse impact of climate change. We will also look for alliances with strategic action uh, actors, such as the Platform on Disaster Displacement, the European Union and other stakeholders to strengthen capacity in the South American region through the use of uh, technical and financial support. And finally, Chile reaffirms at this council its vocation to agree positions, promote cooperation alliances, uh, which will accelerate uh, mitigation measures and adaptation to climate change phenomena on a global level, and to look at the effects on human mobility. Thank you very much. And thank you, Excellency. Thank you very much. Um, I now have um, Mr. Ando Andre Perry Esquivel, Director of International Peers National Directorate for Migration, Argentina, as my last speaker on my list. Um, you have the floor, Excellency. Thank you very much, Chair, Director General of the IOM of the FAO, all those present, we'd like to thank the IOM for raising the importance of this subject, both on a global level and in Latin America in general, where we see an alarming panorama or in terms of uh, food security and uh, the increase in disasters brought about by the impact of climate change. Uh, both processes overlap and uh, feedback to others uh, affecting certain population groups, uh, but society as a whole. When it comes to uh, food security, we uh, set out the law 25724 in 2003, and in 2020, we had a plan against hunger and within the UNFCC, we've been working on the subject and also with the Paris Agreement in 2015. This year, we've approved the National Adaptation and Mitigation Plan, which goes to 2030. We have one of the most consolidated institutional models on a global level when it comes to the respect of the human rights of migrants. Uh, our national constitution uh, promotes immigration and uh, we are one of the countries that has ratified the most uh, human rights conventions within the universal system and the inter-American system. And we ensure that there is equality of treatment of all, including our nationals and non-nationals. Our country has signed many international agreements, uh, including the Global Compact on Safe, Orderly and Regular Migration, the Global Compact for refugees, the Sendai framework, uh, and we work together to find state responses to the growing phenomenon of uh, forced displacement through natural disasters. And within this framework, we have set up a program for humanitarian visas for people who are nationals and residents in the, in Mexico, Central America and the Caribbean who have been displaced by, displaced by social and natural disasters. And we cannot 
find bearing in mind that their nationals cannot uh, establish themselves in Argentina under the criteria of nationality, but it applies to nationals of countries in Mercosur and associated states. Uh, it is a permanent uh, position which ensures that uh, we offer collaboration to states in 23 countries across Latin America and the Caribbean, or should there be any natural disasters. The uh, targeted population, whether they are internal displaced or cross-border displaced, uh, um, whatever their migratory stage, status can request a visa. The humanitarian visa is being developed with many international actors to ensure that we can maintain its sustainability across time, and we are pioneers in our region with this system. We also have a focus on South American migration, and we have set up mechanisms to act where there is massive ingress or a sudden ingress of displaced persons due to various disasters. And this includes Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Paraguay, and Uruguay. We have also played an important role in terms of international cooperation. We were elected this year to chair pro tempore the Ibero-American Migration Authorities Network, and we're working in more than 10 countries to work with cross-border displacement and assistance to persons in the context of disasters. In a few weeks, we will also take on the pro-temporary chairmanship of the specialized Mercosur Migration Forum for the first semester of 2023, where we will work on a regulatory project which will work on human mobility in the context of disasters. And we are also working on a regional network on migration, the environment, uh, disa natural disasters and climate change within the framework of the South American Migration Conference. Uh, and this was uh, chaired by Argentina in 2021. And we want to continue contributing to the guidelines the Chileans have already mentioned. We have a clear and active position through our legislation public policy and international cooperation because we have a commitment to leave no one behind all countries to have responsibilities to take on and we have to ensure that uh, we don't forget these crises continue to occur we need to work uh, in an integrated and comprehensive comprehensive manner internationally and across governments so that we can build greater levels of resilience in our societies. No one can develop alone. Thank you for listening. And I'd like to thank the IOM yet again for their constant support. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we come to the close of um, the meeting today. I thank you all for uh, the very insightful, uh, sometimes very passionate statements that you've made. Um, there's still a long list of speakers. Uh, so tomorrow we begin with that. Um, I, I love speakers at 10 a.m. In the meantime, um, there is a reception just across the, the hall somewhere. Yeah, so why can't we um, go and have a little booze? Okay. <laughs> thank you all. I, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Yes. Thank you. You, can, you can toast me. It's my birthday. Oh, thank you.